This is with Nick Cannon. He already looks nervous, bro. Look at his, look at his. <laughs> Why does he already look nervous? Okay, I heard this is good. We should watch it. Family Dynamics. Let's go. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are back once again. It's an honor, privilege, and a pleasure uh, to be in a safe space in a brave place uh, where it's not about canceling, it's about counseling. And I am joined by the founder of the Dr. Bryan Institute. Um, and I honestly, I've, I've, I've never had more reverence. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, especially as a person who grew up watching Nick Cannon, I do like his sense of fashion. I really don't appreciate necessarily his choices in life, but also shout out to Mariah Carey. But I really do love this pink suit. I'm not even going to play. It's super cute. It's just the tie is cute. I'm not the biggest fan of the shoes, but very Elton. I like it. <laughs> For an individual in this setting, not only because uh, she's truly a professional and kind of walks the walk and talks the talk, uh, but she she reads me. She puts me in my place and talks to me uh, in, a, in a way that uh, I receive it um, because she has over 17 years in her profession as a therapist. What did he just say out loud? She has over 17 years in her profession. Ooh, 17 years, girl. As a, She has a whole teenager, almost an adult, of career time. Therapist and uh, an expert in psychology, uh, but also keeps it real. She ain't here cussing, calling, you know, <laughs> referring to, she's saying all the words. Let's just say that. I'm excited to talk about you. I mean, uh -oh. we, we, gen <laughs> we generalize, you know, conversations about, you know, the black woman in whole. We even talked a lot about, you know, black men specifically. We, we kind of dove into my life. I come from um, San Pedro, which is a community in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Uh, small city, small town, product of two teenage parents. They had me at 16 and 17. The cool thing Likewise. is, though, right? The yeah. cool thing is they were high school sweethearts and um, they didn't get pregnant on accident. I love this oh. small story. They actually planned me walking home from school. Of course, they're broke kids and said, oh, wow. let's go make a baby. We're in love. Right. You know, went and got a motel, couldn't afford a hotel, literally. So I was wow. I was I was conceived in a motel. So, you know, you know, I got it hey. naturally. Never I'm back. I'm back. Hilarious. <laughs> no, but it had me in a motel. So planned me. But obviously we're teenagers. And, um, you know, th there you have it. And grandparents stepped in and raised me because they were teenagers. Same story. I mean, except for my I wasn't planned. I don't think my uh, I went to my dad's high school graduation. So oh. it's wow. like, um. Uh, only because he graduated later in life, right? Is what I'm thinking. Oh, he was a baby at the graduation. I get it. Brittany can math. Brittany, I can math, guys. Um, but again, like my dad was, due to his, you know, had had some street ties, doing some things yeah. that and yeah. gave his life to the. You know, I just want to say this out loud in case it is, uh, not understood. You know, growing up with parents from Iraq, growing up with like immigrant people. It is not abnormal to have babies at 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. It is not abnormal to get married. It is not great. And I think we should break those generational curses. But I mean, my grandma had 17 kids because she started early. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, a lot of my aunties were even married at 16. So in some cultures, it's not that abnormal to be a teen parent. But I think what's important to acknowledge is that I still think these are generational curses we should stop. I think these are obligations we pass on to our children that maybe we shouldn't obligate them to like procreating at a young age or making the most babies possible. And I think, you know, that's important. Look at somebody who wanted six kids her whole life. It is weird to be two years into not wanting to do that. And I think that that is just how my journey went. But I think what's necessary is to recognize why, you know, I'm not just doing it for one reason. There's like 20 million reasons not to have a kid or to have a kid. I think sometimes people just want one reason to have a kid because they had sex or because they wanted to. And I think it takes a lot more discernment to choose not to have children. And that's the irony of it all. People will make babies without even thinking about it. And then the people who decide not to have kids will be criticized as if they didn't put enough thought into it. It takes a lot more thought to not have children than a lot more thought to have them. And you all should put much more thought into when you're having kids. But that's just not how human beings have worked as a species yet. We're working on it and we're kind of growing into that, right? Lord, and even in that process, uh, yeah. he's trying to do the right thing and 
got a young lady pregnant and, and you know, oh, wow. he went on to, you know, go further his ministry and go to college and get out the hood to wow, North Carolina. Wow, look at that. You know, my mom went and worked her ass off and was a single mom, but, you know, yeah. my father's mother was the one who actually kind of stepped up and was the matriarch for See, us and all. See, my mom's mother stepped up and raised yeah. all of us, and my dad, my product of a street guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the founder of one of the biggest, I don't want to say, but biggest games them, here in uh, L.A. Uh, big, 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 big organizations. Yeah. Um, community organizations. Community organizations. <laughs> and so I am, de I am literally like the epitome of uh, the product of a street guy. When I say epitome, mm -hmm. like grew up with my dad being one of the biggest drug dealers and being street. There was nothing not street about him. Um, to the point where even coming home, I couldn't go inside the house until he checked the whole house with his pistol and came back outside and said, baby, it's clear. I couldn't have a key to our house um, because I couldn't be there alone in case drug deal or something went bad. I couldn't be found there alone where, you know, but I knew where the safe was. I knew where the stuff was. I knew the safe code. He's like, if they come, you give it to him. So like a movie, um, but dad transitioned like your dad not to ministry but just to being a family man mm -hmm. and being a man who owns businesses and makes good money um and so best friends was a dad kind of how you're saying with your girls where he put me up on game told me if you meet a man who looks smells thinks has any res resemblance of me <laughs> it's a no don't bring him home don't <laughs> date him run yeah, nothing right. hmm. and he's told me that he said baby um god makes two you know that's really interesting actually that her dad warned her about men like himself three men either a excellent father horrible man or excellent husband horrible father or you're blessed to get both mm. and mm -hmm. he said make sure that you get if you have to choose one you get the man who's a better husband than a father because as a woman that really? will be yeah that'll benefit you as a woman because a man is going to be there for their kids at the level that they love the mom and i find mm -hmm. that to be you could disagree That's but i find that to be very true meaning the father usually loves that child at the level that it loves that mama. And so that's why men with multiple baby mamas, I'm not saying for you, mm. you can kind of see where the favoritism or the time goes based on the love and respect they have for. Yo, that's kind of true though. I have seen in those dynamics that the kids whose baby mama is favored get better attention from the dads. That's why y'all are fucked up. See how dysfunctional that is? See how dysfunctional that is? That's crazy. Or that woman. And my dad's a good father. There's six of us yeah. by five different women. And he's a good father like a to man all of my us. Hey. She is like the perfect person to probably talk about this with these types of men and to break those generational curses because that's crazy. Yo. That's that's a lot. You know, it's so funny. Um, oh, that's so funny. You know how there's like this uh, obsession in some bubbles of wanting your kids to look like you so you can really see that family, you know, that family, whatever, that the nose or the ears or the thing that look like that, you know. I just saw a little, what's it called? A little um, ultrasound of my newest nephew who's headed on, you know, heading in, onto the planet. And, you know, he already has that huge nose. And we're like, there's that Assyrian nose, baby. And we're like, look at this huge nose. And we're like, we're ready. We're like, yep, let's go. And he looks just like his dad. And, you know, all the kids come out looking just like the family. And it's like, I, you know, this is not to say anything about adoptive kids or anything like that. But it's just like, it's interesting that you have the, a bubble in which you want all the kids to kind of look like the parents or the family. And then you have another bubble where the kids all look different because they're from different genetic lines. And then you have kids that don't look like anything like anybody because, you know, they're adopted or whatever, whatever it is. I just think it's interesting how human beings, taking ourselves out of it, just observing humans as an animal species, how we tend to populate and then how we tend to come together and who we decide to make babies with and how it all works out. And it is sort of funny. It is sort of interesting. Just, I find it just really interesting. Zooming out, of course, it's a lot more in our feels when we're zooming in to our own family dynamics. But yeah, it's so, it is, it's so animalistic. It is, it is so just... The bees are doing it. The bears are doing it. The humans are doing it. Like, we're all just out here doing it, you know? He's a man of your cloth. <laughs> right. um, but I would say only, I would just, and, you know, because I'm, I definitely want, want to give you the opportunity to tell your story and your journey. But I would just add to that, because maybe there's some, 
some context yeah. there. Um, I personally feel like my children come first. Oh yeah. So therefore, even like, with my the dad mother, feels that way yeah, too. even so with the mothers, like I gotta, and because like anyone who's dealing with me in a romantic setting has to know, like, all right, it's about the kids yeah. first and foremost, yeah. and then. Yeah. yeah, this is interesting because it it means different things to different bubbles. We can wine and dine and do all the things that we need to do to cater to your uh, desires, but. Okay, hold on to the person in chat who said, uh, I don't find Nick attractive. I don't know. He just seems slimy. Oh, he is attractive, but slimy. That's why you don't touch him. People, his baby mamas all talk very good about him, but, you know, um, you know. Anyways, with that said, I think it's interesting because I grew up in a household where it was like God first, your parent first, then the kids. And again, that's about prioritizing the, the team. You know, it's about prioritizing the team. And I think that that's interesting and important because eventually, just like I said, you have to prioritize your marriage. Your parents are going to die. You need to prioritize your spouse. Your children will leave you as they should. It doesn't mean at the expense of. You do not need to prioritize your children at the expense of your marriage, nor your marriage at the expense of your children. That's why you have to be prepared to handle the responsibility of balancing your different dynamics with different people in the family. Your relationship with your daughter is not the relationship you should have with your wife. I hope to fuck's sake you understand that. With that said, there will become times where maybe your wife and your daughter come between you and you have to, with wisdom and discernment, make a decision. Or maybe you're a mother, okay, and your father and your son are, or your husband and your son are going at it and there has to be a conversation because your son will become a man and then he will challenge his father to some extent and say, I think I want to do it things differently than I was raised. And that's a big deal in the home. Like I said, okay, in my opinion, in my little, you know, <laughs> newly married opinion, I feel like the best way to do a relationship is to prioritize the relationship over yourself, but never at the expense of yourself and yourself over the relationship, but never at the expense of the relationship. I love my family and I prioritize them, but not at the expense of my marriage. And I prioritize my marriage, but not at the expense of my family. If my mother came to me, my father came to me and said, leave your perfect husband that you love so much because we are selfish and narcissistic and we want you for ourselves, I would say never. And if my partner came to me and he was like, leave your family for me because I'm narcissistic and egotistical and I need all of your attention and you can't have any friends or family, I would say absolutely not. Because a healthy dynamic is one that lets all relationships exist with boundaries. If my partner or my parents ever tried to control how I had a relationship with these people and use an ultimatum on me, that would indicate to me that I'm coming from dysfunction or I'm in a dysfunctional cycle. But obviously, my partner isn't dysfunctional. My parents are not dysfunctional in that way. We've all grown in different ways. Everyone's dysfunctional in their own way. But overall, we are healthy people who are working on ourselves, even through our disagreements, and we are maintaining respect because just a reminder, I am now in my mid-30s, okay? My partner and I are in our 30s. We're old. Our parents have done their work. And now my parents can see the consequences of that work played out in their adult children. And they must accept it is what it is. And if they feel they have failed their children, they can take that up with their God because I've already done the therapy for it. And then, of course, if they have any issues with how their children turned out, they can also talk to their therapist about that because I've already talked to mine. Okay. But yeah. I think maybe that adds to why you said, like, if a man who's going to take care of his kid, only re because I, it, to me, it's not even about, like, I can, ha I could despise the mom, but right, that has right, nothing right. to do with Absolutely, the child. Absolutely, yeah. And I think in our community, a lot That's of That's good. I think he's right. Like, even if you have an issue with the person you made a baby with, you can't take it out on the kid. Uh, I, first of all, I've tried to be an example in that space because we have seen men who, oh, because I don't rock with your mama, therefore I don't rock with you. Right, right. And I think, you know, if anything, that that that's a sin at a different level. But mm -hmm. I could see how you can easily fall mm -hmm, into that mm -hmm. because especially if there's conflict there and if someone's making There's some deep, deep trauma in some people who have children and they can't even look at the child because it looks too much like the person they made that child with. And I think that that is the trauma that needs to be healed. You will give it to your child. Look at you punishing a child because of the person you decided to make that baby with or maybe didn't decide to make that baby with, right? Not everybody always gets to choose who they make a baby with, right? And so sometimes that's very traumatizing. But that's why we say, you know, you know, you only have so much power in your life, but with the little bit that you have, you can do so many things. You really don't have that much power. 
right? You're susceptible to your biology, the time in which you're born, the economy, your ethnicity, how people perceive you, your orientation, how people understand your culture. And yet you have so much power in your own life. And it can, it can really move mountains. But I think sometimes people have to see it to believe it. So prove it to yourself by at least trying. Because then you'll have the data to know that it works. Making it difficult for you to be a father. Yeah. All you can do, again, going back to our few, yeah. uh, past yeah. sessions, is retreat, mm -hmm. is flee. Yeah. Because I'm not going to go back and forth with you because you're breaking my heart because you're not allowing me to see my child. Mm. And I can't deal with the heartbreak, so I'm running away from the heartbreak. Not really the responsibility, but the responsibility gets negated as well. But if you're using my That's child as a gets. pawn, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. what type of individual are you? But talk about dysfunction. Who uses a kid in a game of chess unless you're dysfunctional? Who uses your kid to fight battles unless you're fucked up? And that's the thing people don't realize about themselves. How do you tell me you're a reasonable, rational adult and you're using a child in the middle of a battle? That, that nervousness, that fear of divorce court is a fear because of dysfunction, not because of gender. Men aren't afraid of women because of divorce court. They're afraid of the women they chose who are dysfunctional enough they made a baby with them. Women aren't afraid of divorce court. They're afraid of the men they chose you are afraid of the choices that you made because you know you, you made it with somebody who's so fucked up and now the baby's in the middle of that fucked upness. And that's why I say, if you think you're so fucking smart, act like it. And if you're not that fucking smart, then start saying it. Say, I was dumb as fuck. I made a mistake. Maybe you were tricked. Maybe you were coerced. Maybe somebody, you know, laced your birth control, took out the condom, poked a hole in it, whatever happened, okay, a lot of us have a lot more freedom in who we choose to be partners with than we, than we admit to. And that's why I say it takes two to be toxic. You are rarely purely a one-sided victim. You are probably a person in a cycle. And it's probably because you were traumatized. Everybody on this planet has trauma. It's just a matter, how, it's a matter of where you fall in the storyline. Okay? It really depends. So know who you are in the story, guys. Okay? <clears throat> anyway. And we don't care about the type of individual you are. If my eyes on the prize to see my child, then by all means necessary, let me run these plays. Yeah. And I got to sit in emotion or deal with the emotions. And I just got to get my mom. That's, that's what okay. we got to learn. That's, I mean, we, yeah. we just unpack some heavy stuff right there. Yeah, totally. But uh, I mean, yeah. again, in any, any man who is a, a single father, uh, who's desiring to be in their child's life at the highest capacity. I mean, I, I just encourage you just to work through it. Try to become as mo emotionally intelligent as possible and always focus on the child. And Even if you don't necessarily get along with the yeah. mom or you're going to have challenges, you're going to have conflict. And even if she's not at the space, uh, just try to work through it and be there for that child. 100%. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because so. probably as two individuals who, you know, I know I just I came up in an unorthodox household and, you know, I I I appreciate every time my parents put me first before them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes as humans, it's not always I'll give an example. I'll give an example of my parents putting us first over them that I think is like a pretty good one. And again, I'm lucky that this was the experience I got. When my mom and my dad got together in their late 20s, okay, nearly 30s, um, my dad was like in a band. This was before he decided to be like an engineer, for real, for real. He was, he liked to cook and he played music. And they were young, you know, and they were, you know, just living out their life and enjoying it. And my brothers were with them because my mom was married before. And my mom was the first woman in her family to get divorced in that kind of way, as far as I know. And um, she left an abusive marriage and she had my brothers. And I do see the impact it made on those boys. Like I do see it in my brothers and I love it. And, you know, you're doing the work. It just takes time. And my dad came into the picture um, and they sat down and had a very serious conversation about their lifestyle. And they said, because my dad was a bachelor before that and he had a motorcycle and he was in a band and his whole family was engineers. And so he was like getting ready to kind of make that big boy decision about like being a career person in that traditional way. And he was working his jobs and he had a relationship with like, uh, you know, people in the field. Anyways, they sat down and had a conversation basically and said, what do we want our lifestyle to be? And my mom said, I do not want you to be at clubs every night, you know, with cigarette smoke and doing all these things. And it was the 80s. Everybody was smoking, right? She goes, I don't want this to be our life. 
And then they sat down. My mom was making pretty good money because she had a job and she was pretty successful at the time. She made more, more money than my dad when they met. And then my mom's like, well, I don't necessarily want to be working. I want to raise kids. Let's have a big family. My dad's like, yeah, let's have a big family. So my dad went and got serious about engineering. My mom quit her job and became a serious homemaker. They homeschooled their kids. They raised 10 kids total together. My brothers were very young when they came into my dad's life, like very young. And they decided to stop doing the bar thing, stop doing the the motorcycle thing. My dad retired his motorcycles until we got older. He got them back and then he retired them after he got too old. But they stopped hanging out with friends in the same way. We did do some things growing up, dirt bikes, trips to Mexico, hanging out with cousins and family, barbecues. But eventually those things stopped and shifted to sort of a healthier way to interact with people that kind of allowed everyone to adapt to the new changes of the world. Because I think there's a way to live in a bubble with a community that keeps you stagnant as a family. I think sometimes you got to pair off from those families and go your own way. So your family excels, your kids get jobs, they seek out education, they go and make something of themselves in the world. They're trying to do better than their parents did before them, or at least the same level. And my parents did raise basically all children who make a little, like a middle-class living. Like all of us have our own jobs. We're all pretty independent. And even though we all have to deal with our own shit, for the most part, we made it work, I think, because my parents were present in our life. They weren't partying parents. They didn't ditch us for friends or family. They didn't try to replace us with drugs. They certainly were responsible. I knew a family with what I call teenage parents, parents who are the same age as my parents, but somehow always chose partying over their kids, having cheating scandals and divorces over their kids, literally ditching their minor child in high school who was already pretty much an adult at 16 to go live with boyfriends, to go live with girlfriends, and basically never grew up. And I'm lucky that my parents grew up. My parents are grownups, like what I call grown grownups, you know? I'm a grown up, but I'm not grown like that. You know, like I'm not grown like my parents are grown. You know, my parents are grown, grown. And, you know, they figured it out. They're immigrants who, ra you know, raised kids, had a business, paid off a home, established themselves, and did something with their life. They did the thing. But they only did the thing because I think they were ready to sort of break the generational curses that their family put on them. And I'm going to break the one they put on me. And I think that's sort of the irony of the whole thing is that my parents made a decision to be parents. And so I think in those moments, they chose their kids over maybe their instinct to sort of do other things. Now, and I think this is important, one of the reasons I chose not to have children amongst many, many reasons, many good reasons, one of the reasons that made the list was our lifestyle and if we needed to change it for kids. My partner and I agree that in order to reach the height of what we think is good parenting, we would have to change our lifestyle pretty significantly. And for us, that doesn't seem worth it since our desire to be parents isn't there. If our, if our desire to be a parent was there, we would change our lifestyle in a second and there'd be no problem. So ultimately, why we're not having kids, we don't want to. That's the most important reason. But a part of that reason is that we decided we like our lifestyle enough and bringing children into it wouldn't, it wouldn't be worth it for us. I think we'd even, maybe even be a little... I don't want to say resentful because I don't think I'd ever resent a child truly, but maybe I would have been disappointed in myself for not preparing better, you know? So I think overall what Nick Cannon is saying is there are moments in which parents do choose children and they notice it. And I think in those moments, I noticed my parents chose us. I never felt like my parents chose partying for a reason or chose, you know, drugs for any reason. I'm really lucky my parents gave up any vices that could have impacted their children in that way. That doesn't mean they were perfect. And it definitely didn't help growing up with homophobic parents. That was really stressful for like a little queer kid growing up. But at the same time, I can still be grateful for the things they did right. Even and, as your own children. In my value Self-preservation is the first law of nature. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, you got to take care of yourself, but still take the attempt to put your yeah. children's feelings before your own. And I think that. Oh, wait, hold on. Uh, okay. Isabel says, can you think of a situation where an absent parent is best? Yeah. If your parent is a serial killer, if your parent is a serial rapist, if your parent is abusive, if your parent is somebody who's going to hurt you, if, uh, your parent is somebody who's going to 
Um, yes, okay, unsafe. Yes, if your parent is unsafe, you know, if you're having an adult in your life that is unsafe, that's not okay. Whether you're a parent or an uncle, an auntie, a friend, a neighbor, you know, it is very necessary for there to be distance. Now, with that said, and my heart goes out to people who are in bad situations, just because your parent takes time away from you doesn't mean they don't love you. It could just mean they're recovering, right? Who said it? Violet said addicts sometimes have to step away from their kids. And what a beautiful gesture to make to take a moment away from your child to become the parent that they need in the future. I think that is a very commendable thing to do. And I think it is beautiful when people who have children realize, holy shit, I have to work on myself to be a better parent. And they do that. That's why I'm angry at these billionaire men. Not angry. Well, okay, let go of the attachment. They're not mine to be angry at. But it's why it's disappointing to see these billionaire men, millionaire men in positions of power who don't think to themselves, let me do the work to be present in my child with all of the money that I have, all of the time I could make for myself. And maybe they can't. Maybe they'd have to give up their billionaire empire. How worth it it would be to know your child. But I have seen amazing people, you know, give their custody of their kid temporarily to people while they go and get their shit together and come back. And I think that's beautiful. You know, I think it is beautiful for people to walk away and come back and be present in their children's lives. And I think their children will understand. I think out of all the types of children that understand, it is children who see their parents make a very difficult decision to step away from them only to come back. Children are not mad you stepped away. They're upset you never came back. Nobody cries over the parent who went away and came back except in tears of joy because the resurgence of their parents in their life, especially a positive parent, will always be a positive outcome. It doesn't mean they won't need to work through it. It doesn't mean it didn't hurt. But nothing hurts more than somebody who went out to get milk and didn't come back. Okay. That's why the, that's, well, statistically, that's a big reason why the divorce rate is high because of what you just said, people putting kids first. I beg the different, even though my dad agrees with you too. He's, he's <laughs> the dad, he puts us first. He don't care who walks, we come first. So he's been an excellent father, but not the best of man, just being real. Um, and I, me and him had debates where I say, daddy, I don't agree with that. He's like, I've never put a woman before you or even my mother. And I'm saying, I don't agree with that. When I have kids with my husband, we come first. Doesn't mean the kids go without, but when you have two adults mm -hmm, who understand mm -hmm. that we're showing learned behavior and we're teaching our mm -hmm. kids what a healthy relationship looks like. She's so fucking right on this. Yes, you are teaching your children what a healthy relationship looks like, so you better have one. Or you better explain to them what a healthy relationship can look like with a single parent. It doesn't matter if you're single or, or partnered. It's about showing your children what's healthy. You make the best with what you have. Even if it's not perfect, you show your kid that perfect was never necessary for a good life. You never had to be perfect to have a good life. But I do recommend optimism. Like not just for marriage, but also them. It doesn't mean that the kids don't eat and the wife and husband does. It is a hierarchy for me that goes God, my hubs, me, and then the kids. I understand And so that. the covenant is broken. Only for me, I'm not self-projecting. The covenant is broken when it goes the other way. Of course, if I'm married and my husband says, you know, it's <coughs> only, me. only, you know, one person gets to eat and there's three of us. I'm sure both of us are going to equally agree it's the child. Right. But when it comes to making sure our relationship is healthy, which is really the healthiness of the environment for our child. And my, for me, my value is only my husband comes first and I come first. And I find in, in my session Ooh. of 17 years, <clears throat> Nick, uh, there's been many more men than women who come in and say, that the relation I think she just needs to say at the but not at the expense of the children because let me tell you I'll give you a really toxic example of what that could sound like to some people that I think is a really horrifying situation to be in um Ellen DeGeneres had this happen to her I'll use a real life example I read Ellen's book when I was you know coming out of the closet way back in the day and Ellen's mother had a stepfather come into their life and Ellen told her mother that this man had touched her. And Ellen's mother didn't believe her. And in that moment, I think sometimes people internalize this idea of choosing my husband over my kid and situations in which the kid is begging for help. You don't choose the adult over the child when the child is coming to you for help. 
you hear them out and you fix the situation to make it safe for the kid. So I think sometimes what happens is people internalize this as like, I'm going to pick my man over my child and at the expense of the child. Don't pick your man over the expense of a child. Don't pick your woman over the expense of the child, right? And at the end of the day, let's take it out of that context because that context seems so black and white for people in this audience. Let's take it to something a little bit different. And I'll give you an example. Uh, let me think of a good example. It could be something a little bit more casual. Um, it could be something a little bit more casual, like a rebellious teenager comes into the situation and the kid feels like, pick me, like, what? I like this shirt and it's a cool shirt and I think dad thinks it's cool but mom doesn't think it's cool and it's like well maybe mom doesn't think it's appropriate and then they have a conversation about it maybe the dad double takes and goes actually as much as I like that shirt I think it doesn't send the right message and I think your mother is correct it's about choosing the values of the relationship and what it's founded on not over the expense of the child but in favor of the foundation of the relationship the idea is like your child will come to you at a certain time in their life and they might feel abandoned by you picking your partner, but reassured that in the future they want to do it themselves. Because let me tell you this, that child who grows up, whose parents always pick them over the partner, will become a mama's boy or a mama's girl or a daddy's girl or a daddy's boy. They will become children dependent on their parents. And when their parents die, they will be useless adults. Not always, not everyone's a monolith and everyone's, ex you know, exceptional in their own way. Everyone's the exception to the rule in their own way. But I will say that generally your job as a parent is to raise a child who can be independent. Even a child who's disabled must live to learn, what, live, was, must learn to live without their parents when they die. Even a child that is disabled, even a child that is literally forced into a chair for the rest of their life must learn to live without their parents because your parents will die on you. So as a parent, you must set that child up to be independent without you, especially a child that is reliant on medical care, especially a child who is disabled, especially a child who depends on you to teach them how to literally survive after you die. And that is your only fucking job as a parent is to love your child enough to give them the safety that when you die, you both feel good about it. I will tell you this, as of right now, if my parents died, I think all of their kids would be okay. The youngest is about 23. Okay, the oldest is like 42. I think we'd be okay. That wouldn't, that wouldn't have been true about 10 years ago, but I think we're finally at that age where if my parents died today, their kids would be okay. It would be devastating. My parents are so young. They're only 65. But they did their job and they really did their job. And I appreciate that. I really do. Because I think, I see the people around me whose parents didn't do that job and I know their life is going to be hard. Their life is going to be hard in a way that I wouldn't wish on my enemy. It's just going to be so hard. And they are going to be those people who are in our senior citizen group who have nothing, not a dollar to their name when they retire, no family, no commitments, no circle, no love. And they will be one of the many old people that suffer in society because they did not have a community around them. My parents not only raised us to be independent adults, they raised us to be a part of a community. We know how to be good neighbors. We know how to be community members. And I cannot tell you how important that is for a kid. So we feel pretty, you know, I feel pretty grateful for that. Relationship fail. And if you look at divorce rate statistics of when divorce happens, it's after that first child. Yeah. It's after because- they should have never got married in the first probably place. Probably so, but also because, you know, whoever it was, and from my experience, it has been the woman, we're not knocking women, but it's been the woman more who has placed the child first and totally dissipated the man it's out of the relationship. The only reason why I'm gonna have to disagree with you on this, Doc, it's okay. is because if we're talking life, yeah. these mm. children did not ask to be here. Right. They are responsibilities. 100%. As you know, for kids who didn't ask to be here, he sure made a lot of them. For a guy who's aware these kids didn't ask to be here, he sure made a fuck ton of them. You know, sure made a fuck ton of them. That is so funny. I didn't expect Nick Cannon to say that out loud. Just considering, like, Elon made babies because he thinks his genes are superior, right? What is Nick Cannon talking about? Like, they didn't even choose to be here. Yeah, so why'd you bring them here? You literally forced them into existence. As individuals, I can't put my desires and my happiness, mm -hmm. or I shouldn't, right. over someone that I am responsible for.
What does he think he did when he made all those babies? What does he think he did when he made all of those babies? He's acting like he's a victim and he's like, I just got pregnant. I was like irresponsible. He's, his babies are still pretty young. I mean, didn't he make new babies like three years ago? Man, these men really think they're something. These men are so in their ego, bro. I mean, like I said, Elon literally thinks his genetics are superior. His autistic genetics. Just kidding. Shout out to my autists. I'm getting diagnosed maybe in November. Don't, I'm not coming. Okay, don't, don't clip me out of context, okay? I'm just saying it's kind of funny to be like, oh, yes, this disability, <laughs> great to spread around genetically. Not that I'm saying people who are autistic shouldn't have babies. You should definitely have babies. I just think it's funny that it's genetic. Damn it, I'm going to get clipped, bro. I'm going to get clipped. <laughs> mm -hmm. So even I'm not even talking about putting food on the table and all that. I'm right. talking about, like, we're talking about mental, physical, and spiritual well-being in a household. Mm -hmm. I'm not, and, and again, this is, this is, this is pretty heavy. Because one, I've, I grew up with it, and I am a, I'm right. a product of right. it, and I'm producing it. Yeah. Um, when an adult is saying, you know, mama got to live too. Mama need her man. Dad, daddy going to do his thing. I'll be back. When those mentalities are presented to yeah, a child, that's a different mentality. That's where abandonment issues be surface, and mm. where a child feels like I'm not good enough in that sense because they made decisions for themselves before they made decisions for me. And children pick up on that at a mm -hmm. very early. I don't think he's wrong in that. Let me tell you this. His baby mama, I don't know anyone's names. I'm very bad at it. I watch a ton of shows and I don't learn anyone's names. And I watch a bunch of YouTubers and I don't learn their names. And I think names are just difficult, honestly. So I watched this TV show called Selling Sunset. And one of his baby mamas is on that show. And one of the other ladies was like yelling at her and like judging her for having a baby with Nick Cannon. And I'm going to be real with you. I don't care that much. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I couldn't imagine not being friends with her because she made a baby with Nick Cannon. Like, that's not a part of my boundary setting. But I was like, you leave her alone. And I was like kind of mad at that girl, that UK girl for coming at our other girl. And I was like, you leave this girl alone. She can make babies with who she wants. And like, she's rich and she's wealthy and that baby's gonna be relatively fine. I still think it's like not up to my standard, but fuck Britney's standard. It's not the universal like Bible here. So I was kind of a little upset during that season of the show. Okay, thank you, JJ in chat. JJ knows, JJ watches. Let's go, JJ. Because I was pissed. Just like, mind your business, okay? It truly, mind your business. The age. So I much rather say, it ain't about your mama right now. I'm rocking with you. Mm -hmm. And say that to my child as much as possible. Oh, sorry, Nick. I'm really cutting people off today. Yes, who is that? Dana, my ex-husband put his daughter first and it ruined our marriage. He spent so much time with her. Everyone thought she... His daughter was his wife. Uh, she was 22 and married herself. Wait, his wife and she was 22 and married herself. L listen to this. Listen to me when I say this. Have you seen those moms on TikTok that are like, I love my son, pictures with my son. It went viral recently and I was dying. And it looks like they're married to their sons. And I'm like, okay, let's go to therapy. The incest is not wincest, okay? It might not be literal incest, but it's emotional incest and you fucking know it, okay? You fucking know it. These like boy moms who are in a specific category, not all boy moms, the daddy's girls, not all daddy's girls, but the certain categories. You all need to stop having your emotional incest with your parents and family and learn to grow the fuck up, okay? And I've seen it and I've cringed at it. I felt the ick. I see the red flags. I would never tell. Let me, when I say this, I will never marry into that type of family. You could not, you take my left arm because I don't use it that much. If you, I would never. Okay. When I say be careful who you marry because of who their parents are, I mean, be careful about the relationship they have with those parents. What are the boundaries? Listen, I live near my in-laws. We live within 15 minutes of each other. We all live very close, right? And they are very respectful of boundaries. We see them once a month for a family dinner. It's very fun. We have a favorite restaurant. We have a favorite meal. We get the same thing every time because it's our favorite thing to get. Um, they are so respectful. They never drop by unannounced. They always give us a heads up if they're in town. They're like, hey, we're driving by. We'd love to drop off some food or something. That's so nice. I love that. Thank you so much. We're super grateful. They never make us feel bad about 
how often we see each other. They're very good, okay? His mom and I, we we text, okay? We send, I send her pictures of Indiana Jones. She sends me pictures of them going on a walk. Okay, Indiana Jones is my cat. We have good boundaries, okay? We have a relationship we've established. Same with my parents, okay? They're very respectful. If we lived in California where they live, they would also be very cautious about dropping by. You know, they wouldn't just come unannounced. They'd be very respectful, very cutesy, very demure. And at the end of the day, that's just what we've established. You can establish something different. Before I was married and when I was single and living with my siblings because we were all roommates at one point, it was so fun. COVID was great because I was living with my siblings and we were just having the greatest time rooming. My brother, who was not our roommate but lived in town, with, he would just show up unannounced. And that was great because, you know, he wasn't going to walk in on anything. But now that I'm married... I feel like you should call ahead because we're married now. Okay. And they also know my stream schedule. So at least they can come when I'm streaming if they want to visit him or something. Like the idea is that people are cautious. They know you're an adult in a marriage now. Okay. This isn't a 90s sitcom where you can just walk through the front door and we won't be banging next to the TV. You know what I'm saying? Be respectful of the possibility that I could be trying to have kids while on this birth control. Thank you. Even if that hurts mama's feelings, mm -hmm. to me at least, because I know that child is going to grow up with a certain level of self-worth mm -hmm. that they didn't feel like daddy put work before me, daddy mm -hmm. put women before me, daddy put whatever before me. Mm -hmm. if, if, if I can instill anything into my own. Wait, 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 wait. No, 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 no. Daddy put everything before me. Daddy put uh, a woman in front of me. Dad didn't just put a woman. He put your mother. That's why you don't fuck around when you have kids. So you don't have to put a woman before your child. You're putting their mother out of respect for her being the mother of your children. You put her. See the difference? Your father should never choose a woman over you. He should respect your mother because that is her place. That is why, okay, you got to keep your shit together and raise children who know why you're prioritizing somebody over them, but not at the expense of you. Of course, a child would want to feel like, oh, dad picked pussy over me, which we see with a lot of these rich men. We do see these rich men pick pussy over their kids. And it's gross. You're gross. You're gross men. You choose money and pussy over your own children. You're gross. A grown up, a mature man prioritizes his wife and the sanctity of their marriage over the rebelliousness or activity of a child, but never at the expense of a child. If your child has medical care, needs, if you need to actually be a parent in that moment, you always pick being a parent. My partner and I, when we were choosing not to have kids, we were going through, um, we were going through like the what ifs, like scenarios of children. We were trying to figure out how we would parent, if we would be good co-parents, or not co-parents, but good parents together. And we were giving examples. Okay, your child, like as an example, a lot of family dynamics will be hide the child's homosexual homosexuality or transness or their uniqueness, their autism, their disabilities, their journeys from the grandparents. The grandparents won't approve. So we pick the grandparents over the sanctity of the child. Never in my household, household would I choose my parents' approval over the sanity of my child. One of the first eight questions I asked my partner, everybody knows what it was. What was it? How do you feel about having trans kids? Because in this household, we are not going to ignore the fact that our child might be going through a journey like transness or gayness. We're never going to hide them, you know, shush them away, tell them to be seen but not heard. Never, never would we tell a child that. Over what? The validation of grandparents whose generational expectations should die with them? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So when I married this person, I married a person that I thought if we were to make a child together, we must fight for this child against every traditional expectation that is put in place to maintain patriarchy and misogyny and misandry and bullshit that should have died with our parents in their therapy sessions that they never went to. Because who are we to put that on our children over the approval of, no, absolutely not. The same people that sent us to the therapy office in the first place, you want us to uphold that tradition? No, we're good, okay? So again, with peace and love, Prioritize your children, but not at the expense of your marriage. And prioritize your marriage, but not at the expense of your children.
Fight for vulnerable people, whether they are your wife or your child, your husband or your child, or even your dog, or even your mother-in-law who needs some sort of advocacy, or your father-in-law that needs it in his elderly years. Whatever it is, fight for the people that need it. Do not fight against the people that are helping you, but have strong boundaries. I'm open, but I have boundaries. Children is that you are my number one priority. Mm -hmm. Even all that I do is for you. You are my number one priority, but I'm going to make more children with more women that takes more time away from you and my priority towards you. Doesn't sound like you're prioritizing your kid. Sounds like you're prioritizing your dick. Every dollar that I make is going to you. So, again, I'm pretty sure people in the comments going to debate yeah, yeah. and have different things. Like, and even, no, I, and I, yeah. I, we all have different experiences, but every time I see an adult put their happiness. But you're describing more of an adult saying, I'm going to do me at the expense of you. That's even in, even in a marriage. Yeah, she said it. She said it. She said the expense of you. She said it. Oh, I love her. So I'm saying even in a marriage, but that's, we're not talking about the level of I'm going to do me at the expense of your needs. I'm going to do me for my pleasures. Because we do that as that. humans. But a healthy family dynamic takes balance and it's very unhealthy for a child to feel like they are number one above authority because mm. what happens is they grow up to then disrespect authority, which we entitled and they grow up with this narcissistic type of, um, personality even if they're not diagnosed with it and then you have spoiled brats kids, and then you have these kids who don't respect when when law enforcement pulls them over we have an issue they're going to school and these teachers can't even get them to well even more than law enforcement okay because you know <laughs> we're not the biggest fan of the cops over here but like you know i don't know how republican this woman is she might be like okay but i will say like you have to respect the power of authority in the sense that it could hurt you and that's why you have to learn a good relationship with authority which is not perfect, by the way. It's not going to be a perfect relationship. I mean, I think every child that sur every child should surpass the wisdom and knowledge of their parents. Okay, I respect the elders in my community. I know what it means to have an elder. I grew up in a culture in which the patriarch, the father, the grandfather, has final say even over his grown children. Right? Because not literally, not in their everyday lives. But you know, if we're all together at a get together and my grandfather's speaking, you don't disrespect my grandfather, right? God rest their souls. They're all dead and I'm my grandparents. But it's like you're learning to respect the people that came before you, but the people who came before you should expect you to surpass them. In my opinion, you should be smarter than your parents and you should be wiser than them because the idea is that the next generation will always be better. But I think sometimes we settle for the next generation will remain stagnant because parents who don't allow their kids to grow past them are jealous of their own children for gaining any sort of wisdom outside of them. And I have to remind even the elders in my own community, reminder that you want us to be smarter than you eventually. You do not want your children to remain, quote, dumber when IQ literally diminishes as you get older, guys. Like if you want to take the science IQ route, IQ literally diminishes over time. You do not want your kids to be less wise than you, less smart than you as you age into your elderly years. You want to trust the next generation can handle you because you gave them the tools to do it, right? The thing is like humans aren't perfect like that. Humans are incredibly imperfect and we don't do the right things by our parents. We don't do the right things by our elderly. We're not thinking about them. And the truth is, is you don't always have to because maybe you didn't have that kind of relationship with the elders in your community. But the idea is the elders need to put what's in place for you to even have that relationship with them in the first place. That is so ironic, isn't it? The elders have to have a good enough relationship with the young people in order for those young people to even morally have the obligation to take care of them in their elder years. Do not disrespect the youth that will wipe your butt one day. Do not respect, do not disrespect the elders that have already wiped yours. It is a relationship of positive symbiosis. Okay? A relationship of positive symbiosis. We work together. You wipe my butt, I wipe your butt. But in order to wipe butts, we must also understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. And it has to be for the healthy reason, not the unhealthy reason, not the, I have to take care of them, even though they abused me, even though I feel horrible when I'm with them, they're my dad. You do not, you do not have to care for your abusers. You do not have to care for your abusers. That is not what we're talking about here to sit still enough because they're so used to being number one and things going their way. No, no, no. 
listen, the first place a child should get their feelings hurt by hearing no, or the first place a child should see that you are not always number one is circumstantial should be at home because life is going to teach you that you are not always going to be the butter cake of everybody's uh, a dessert. Uh, I, I Nick, I'm the sorry. Cake. <laughs> you know, so, but what I'm saying, then what that does is that creates that emptiness that I was, and I'm going to poke at you again, that emptiness and that, that mm. sense of inadequacy within you because you were groomed in a certain way that life can't maintain. And so what happens is you're number one and you're, 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 you're the golden child and all these things that happens with athletes. Then you go into the real world after you retire and everything shatters. Now you got depression, your suicide ideation. But they you still have accomplish things that most people will never accomplish. Men always do this. This certain type of men, the specific form of man. But look at all that I accomplished. Who cares what Andrew Tate did? Look how much he accomplished. Who cares what XYZ did? Look at everything they accomplished. Who cares if this man doesn't tuck his kid at night? Look at all that he accomplished. For every time a man beats you, as long as he's got a million in the bank, it's okay, right? Cool. Shout out to Natalie. Welcome to memberships. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Listen, experience. Yes, men are obsessed with greatness. Thank you, Kay. And for those who didn't see my conversation with Rashad Crenshaw yesterday, go check it out. It's on my live stream tab. It's under the playlist of live stream collabs. Check it out because we talk about that. Remember that great men are just men. They're imperfect beings. Great countries are imperfect constructs. And trust me, to be a great man, to be a great country, you had to have murdered and pillaged millions of lives. It is not without consequence. To be a great man, you will sacrifice the bonding with your child. To be a great man, you will abandon the people who love you. Greatness does not come without a consequence. The question is, what are you willing to pay for this greatness? It is more than just sleepless nights. It's great experience mm. because we told them how great they were from the beginning. We instilled in them that we're going to support you all the way along your ride so you can not only but reach what, the levels what, that you want, so you can reach back and then get the rest said. of the family. We will support you along your ride. That does mm. not mean that that kid doesn't understand balance, that there's a thing called boundaries that our community mm. doesn't seem to have. Probably because of that dynamic, the boundary goes Baby, we've been at your football game, your soccer game, your ballerina game, daddy and I all day. It's nine o'clock. It's shutdown time. There's a boundary yes. where it's time where mm. this is our time and you're yes. teaching your child how to grow up and not be a narcissist that then mm. needs his woman or her man to put them first over everything, which is a fairy tale and unrealistic. You're teaching them the balance between we are a family dynamic. There's times that daddy's gonna come first, there's times that mama's gonna come first, and there's times that you come first. But what we do is we teach that so that it becomes more of a wholesome type of feel, not me, 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 me. And the moment you don't get me, 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 you you flee because you can't sit in your emotions of hearing no because you got to control things to keep things the way you need it which is called oh she's so good bro codependency so what you describe is then creating a codependent child that says if i'm Ooh. not the center guess what fuck all this because I oh she just called him codependent creating bro another thing my parents did well look this is the this is the episode where i gassed my parents up bro Another thing my parents did well is bedtime was 8 p.m. Every night my parents had a schedule. We had mom and dad from morning till night and they got each other from night until morning. And that's why I got 10, nine siblings, okay? That's why they got 10 kids. The idea is that eight o'clock was always our bedtime. Mom and dad's time and they, they do it to this day, okay? 40 years together to this day. Eight o'clock, I know if I call my parents from, I'm in Europe, if I call them and it's 8 p.m. their time, I know what they're doing, okay? They've got their gula, they've got their chai, they've got their news or their TV show. To this day, 8 p.m. is their time. I know if I call my parents between, mm, it depends. If I call my parents between like one and two, I guarantee they're having lunch together. If I call my parents between mm, mm, five, six, they're having dinner together. Okay, having supper by eight. I know my parents' schedule because they've had it together for years. Gula is seeds. It's just sunflower seeds, like seeds. So, and then chai is just tea. Obviously, I'm sure you guys know that. But like, it's just, they have their schedule. And they had it since I was a kid and they have it to this day. 8 p.m. rolls around. I know my parents are on that couch. My mom's got her favorite pillow. My dad's got his favorite chair. And they are doing their thing together. Okay. 
With that said, my parents are very routine people. I'm a routine person. I like my routine. My partner is a routine. We like our routine, you know, but it is their time. They need time as much as anybody else. Just like if you don't have kids, my partner and I, we have our own. This is my office. If you guys are new to my audience, this is my office and he has his own office. And then we have our, you know, primary bedroom and we have time together. And I'll say, I love you so much. Do you need me for anything? I kind of want to have some alone time. And he'll say, no, I'm good. Is it okay if I go have alone time? And I'm like, yeah, I'll see you in a couple hours. And we go, yeah. And then we separate into our own rooms and we kind of do our own things. We're both computer people. So like I got my three monitors. He's got his three monitors and we're just sitting here doing our things on our computers. And then one day, you know, one moment in the day, I'll be like, oh yeah, I have a person. And a couple hours later, I'll check the time. I'll go check on him. Knock, knock. How are you doing? It's about checking in with your partner and saying, look, I'd like your time. I'd like some separate time. I'd like, hey, do you need me? It's about checking in. And so with our kids, even though the kids didn't want to go to bed at eight, my parents' rule was, it doesn't matter if you're asleep, but you have got to give us our space. And so we do that, okay? And the kids do it to this day. If our parents want space to be together, who am I to come between a love story, bro? My parents are in love, love. They're in love, love, okay? They are each other's best friend. They spend every minute together as they can, but within reason have their own hobbies and own lives. Who am I to take away their 8 p.m. time together? Not me, girl. And... Now, like she said, it gives me a living example. Look at me. I now get to go on the internet and have a living example of how my parents made a 40-year marriage work and raised 10 kids together, okay? Because I have that, that is my life. I'm so lucky. I get to use examples and it wasn't perfect. Y'all know some of my background, but there was plenty to be grateful for. I'm not no, the center it ain't of gotta attention. be the center. It, it gotta be the understand Nick, that in the in a Nick, dynamic. Kids create. We grow up to if we don't do the work, right, and get a sense of self. We grow up to create the exact environment we learn to thrive or survive in. Period. That's all we know. We can't create past what we know. That's why experience teaches words don't. So if our child or my child or your beautiful kids are are always at the center of you, she's really complimentary to the kids, which I appreciate because I know it's very. I need to be better at that because it's very personal talking about people's families you're never talking about the kids but you're talking about the consequences of the parents bad action impacting the children and i know people get very butthurt about it i've already hurt lots of bad parents feelings on the internet about it i will be better at it because i'm never talking about your precious kids bro i would never talk about someone's kids unless they're grown kids like andrew tate's a kid he's somebody's baby and i got words for his parents talk about dysfunctional but you're truly your child, your minor child. I would never talk about your child. I'm never talking about kids. I'm always talking about your parenting. She's very good at complimenting, saying you're beautiful children, you're lovely children. She's making sure because there's a very good chance Nick might get very mad at her and forget that she's not talking about those kids. She's talking about you. And she grows up and gets a man who cannot... He's a great man, but she can't be the center because what if he got kids like you and them kids are the center? That oh, is gonna, she need to pick better. That is gonna, she may have to pick better. <laughs> that's but, the just, line. but just say she has someone who can't give her that same treatment and that's her norm. You have to be realistic about, or should I say aware about what norms am I creating for mm. my kids? Oof. What no, and I'm saying because, listen, I'm a product of. I'm sorry, that is so good. What norms am I creating for my kids? Because all of us look at, you know how we talk about bubbles? Oh my God, I'm sorry, I'm pausing this so good though. You know when we're talking about bubbles and I'm like, oh, that wasn't normal for me. This is what's normal for me. You have so much power as an adult to create your child's nostalgia, what your child will find nostalgic and what your child will find normal, what your child will think they expect of the world. That is how much power you have as a parent. Don't abuse it. With great power comes great responsibility. As the great philosopher Uncle Ben once said, with great power comes great responsibility. You set your child up for what they will expect from the world and what they think they should expect from their partners. What you're saying, I was the golden child. I was the child that came first. And look I at was, you. I was a, but I had to work through a lot of BS. But we Nick. all do. We all have challenges. We all right. come with some shit. And that's why like we're, even right now, we're discussing a very small percentage of people because if we keep it a right. stack, right. we all done been through some shit. Oh, yeah. All and, of us. Yeah. And it, it only makes us stronger in that mm -hmm. sense to where mm -hmm. when we get, when we know how to handle something and, and. I don't know if it makes you stronger. If you're lucky, you overcome and you feel like it makes you stronger. For some of those kids, it just makes them addicts who die under a bridge one day.
adversity builds character in that sense. That's so, what I was going to say. It's more important for kids to see the family dynamic, whether it's together or not, process through things that may be uncomfortable for them as well and get to a resolve collectively than it is for them to be blinded with the fairy tale perspective or perception that's going to form that I'm always number one or I'm using number one. And so that's kind of how life is going to life with me because that kid won't know how to process the reality of what life does. Even mm. when you reach the pinnacle of, of life and, and you, you get titles and success and all that, look, that uphill climb is a mug, boy. And that uphill climb will show you what you came from or what you built. And also it'll show you what environment you were put. I came from a very adverse environment. So that's why I was able to catapult. Cause I wasn't, I didn't know where I was running to. I knew I was running from though. Yeah, yeah. So I put them track shoes on, they're still on. They may, you may see heels today, but them track shoes are never unlaced right. because I'm still running from something, right? And I just happened to run into a lot of amazing opportunities and things and people and blessings and, and, and work and healing. I got blessed to run into that by default and by choice. But mm, if mm, a child- It's called God's favor. God's favor, mm. baby. But we have to to be very, very, very aware, I just, from being in my field of the norm we're creating for our babies, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and of course, it's better to be involved and cause whatever chaos you're gonna cause than have children be have daddy issues or mommy issues, meaning you're just not there at all. But I think you're gonna have both. Yeah, you're gonna have both too. We too. all got but daddy issues, levels. we all got mama issues. But there's different levels to it there, though, there, there are hugely different levels to it. We all got something. Everybody's traumatized. It's just the question of how. That's why I say know who you are in the story. Okay? Some people Naruto and your parents did. Okay? Some people Gojo and they're given too much power and they're too perfect from day one. They don't know how to be a person. Okay? Some people Goku and their parents die and sacrifice and he was raised with, well, that's a whole other story. The point is, Everybody's got a story and everyone's traumatized and everyone has a different relationship with it. Vegeta's dad knew him for most of his life and he's still so traumatized, much more than Goku is. And Goku didn't even really know his dad. You know, I'm just saying, everybody's got a different way of handling the trauma. The question is, what's yours? Okay. What is yours? What is your story? What is your level of trauma? And what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? That's why you go to therapy. You go to therapy to fix your brain, make sure that it's, you know, functioning correctly. Make sure your nervous system is chilling and relaxing, acting all cool, shooting on people outside of school, a couple of guys. Okay. Right? But then philosophy is your why. What is your reasoning for your existence on the planet? And why do you do things? Why do you even have kids in the first place? I would love to know why Nick has decided to make so many babies. That's what I would like to know. Why has Nick decided to make so many babies? Why does he think so highly of himself in this way? Because even to have a baby is to think pretty highly of yourself. You must think you're good enough to have a baby. Or just horny enough to have come in somebody. Who knows? There's, There's different levels absolutely. to it. Absolutely. But at the end of the day, because I'm not, I, I'm not a, a fan of... Freud's perspective is that it, it all comes yeah, from, yeah, 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 you know, yeah, yeah. some reverting back yeah, to yeah, your childhood yeah, yeah. and some because yeah. we need to stop making those excuses and blaming mama and daddy 100%. for who we are. 100%. You can mm -hmm. you can uh, blame mama and daddy for the cause, but you can't blame them for the effect. There you go. Sure. So, or your choices later on once I, you become an adult. Once you understand, yeah. like, yo, I went through some shit, but now I'm going to. But mm -hmm. that's why mental health therapy, coaching, psychologists seeing that going to it. I go to one myself as a doctor. Everyone needs to be in it because it's not about us as a profession, te professional telling you your choices were right or wrong. It's about us helping you figure out the root of that choosing mm, 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 and the norm that you're in and just drawing out a plan that right. works for where you want to be. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people are still in the environment that they don't want to be in because that's the childhood environment they've taken with them and they keep recreating the same pathology and they're going crazy in that. There's lack in that because, they you know, genuinely, I think that's why I was so confused by my decisions in my 20s. Like when I was in the height of like my toxic relationship, I remember, and I've told this a thousand times, but it really does shake me to my core when I looked at him and I said, this is not how I was raised. Why is this my life? I never saw my parents yell at each other, like cuss at each other. I never saw my parents demean each other, or hit each other or like do anything. And I didn't know why I was up at 3 a.m. yelling on the top of my lungs at a partner. And why were we yelling at each other? 
Like, why? What was happening with my life? Like, this isn't the environment I was raised in. Why was, whose life was I recreating? I was kind of recreating his. Like, I was dating somebody who came from a really hostile background, but also more than that, similar to my parents, his parents made something of themselves. Well, his mother did. And same with my mother, but my father did, my mom and dad are in a good relationship, but like our parents made something of themselves in different ways, but they came from something that was harder. I think both my parents came from a harder life and made our life better. And his parents came from a harder life, made their life better. And then when we got together, it was like only our pain made a relationship. Our trauma, not that I think we traditionally trauma bonded because trauma bonding means a lot more than you think it does. But I think we made a relationship on pain instead of a relationship on love. Does that kind of make sense? So when we were screaming at each other, I think, I thought to myself, this is in your parents' relationship. Like this is in my parents' relationship. So whose relationship are we mimicking? And I think it almost like we forgot to reference the people who raised us because we were so mad at them. And then I realized, wait, the people who raised us figured out something about their life so why haven't we figured out ours? Now, him and I, we separated. We didn't go. We broke up. And I got married to a different person, obviously. And I'm much better for it, right? Met somebody in my 30s, had a very different life. But what's interesting about that transition time is during those three years in which I was single and kind of going on first dates and figuring out who I was, every time I met a person who felt like they were going to recreate trauma with me, I was like, no, I wanted somebody who was healthy and a certain level of healthy. I have a podcast about this coming out. My, I'm going to make a graph for you guys on the spectrum of healthy to unhealthy that's in my head that I use to kind of decide like who am I engaging with and what level of healthy are they? Because I'm always looking for a very specific spectrum of healthy. Not perfect, but still healthy. And my pattern in my 20s, because I was in a toxic phase of my life, was to date toxic people regardless of who raised me. Because regardless of how I was raised... I was still dealing with the issues that I was given through that raising and I hadn't become the adult to make my own decisions. I was still blaming my parents. Once I stopped blaming my parents and I accepted they, that they were also adults on a journey, just like I'm an adult on a journey, I could recontextualize my existence as a growing adult and make a new story for myself. And I really changed my life. So I think she's right that you cannot blame your parents for the rest of your life. You can, it can explain why you maybe we're having a hard time or gotten to a bad place, but ultimately you've got to be the captain of your own ship. And much like Luffy, sail off to be a pirate, no matter how much your grandpa wants you to be a Marine. Okay. Shout out to One Piece. Okay. Also, my partner and I have taken a break from One Piece, the anime on episode, like episode 700 and something to watch other animes. But now we're just watching the reenactment of the real life one on Netflix just to see what it's like. And I need you to know I did not see us doing this, going from one one piece to another, but we're doing it. And we're also going to watch the reboot of the new ne ne the new Netflix One Piece. Did you guys hear they're doing it again? They're remaking One Piece. I can't. I can't handle it. And are we going to watch it? We're going to watch it. Now, with that said, uh, Discord said, from an interview, Ken revealed that he once had a vision. Oh, brother. That led him to his virality. Ultimately, most of his kids were unplanned. Wow. But Cannon, Cannon's had a deep moment in which he had been communing with spirits, which he compares to manifestations or even visions that showed him the way. He continued, you get them in pieces or they're fragmented. They never come to him like Father Abraham conversation, like when God promised to make Father Abraham the father of many nations in the Bible. I've never heard the exact clarity, but I heard that like, yo, you're going to be a father of many. They're going to be your great influence, your uh, lineage, your offspring are going to do great things, Cannon said. Now his opinion is more the merrier. Wow. Thanks. Thanks, Discord. I appreciate you posting that. <sighs> the evolution hasn't taken place. And it's not because they don't want to evolve, Nick. It's because they don't have the effective tools to do so. People who come in my session are not there saying, I always just wanted to be messed up. I don't want to evolve. No, they're saying like, had I known this doc five years ago, I swear to God, I would have moved on it. Had I had this tool, I would have moved quicker. Had I knew this is what evolution looked like, I would have jumped a long time ago. Had I known I can jump without a light. Wait, Nick Cannon has lupus. He does have lupus, doesn't he? No. Yeah. Doesn't he? Mm, I can't remember. Does he? 
I know Selena Gomez has it, right? Hold on. Jacket, but I felt safe within myself. I would have been a professional jumper. Right. Right. People just need to know how do I. Nick Cannon announced in 2012 that he has lupus. He does have lupus. Oh, okay. Chronically ill girly. Let's go, guys. P.S. We have September yoga coming up in the Discord if you want to support the content. Join Patreon in exchange. It's 18 plus. I don't want to talk to your parents if you're kids. Thank you. But we have a chronically ill aware yoga we do once a month you know get us going here so shout out to our chronically ill girly nick cannon well i do it and one thing we all want to know is that we're going to be okay when we do everybody just wants to be okay in whatever they're doing and wherever they go will i be okay right well like whether you there are you not doc will i be okay right. and they're only able to be okay when you teach people a sense of self meaning who are you how do you govern you how do you manage which is a better word for control, manage who you are and how do you produce the experience you want because you don't create my experience, I do. I already come came here with the experience I want. Right. You can't create that for me. You already came here with the experience you want. That's the self mastery of knowing how to create that. And when you have that type of knowledge, you'll never be perfect, but you can somewhat try to create a norm for your child. But once they become adults like you and I did, they go and do what they gonna do anyways. Mm. So at that point, you've done what you can do. Mm -hmm. And if you're not in more of a polyamorous, like, you know, relationship like you are, and you're more monogamous one-on-one, -on -one, you're hoping that you put your partner first enough to where y'all still have a damn relationship and you guys can continue to lead by example to your grown children on what a healthy relationship looks like and it's not do not underestimate you aging with your spouse as your kids continuing to see how a healthy relationship works okay do not underestimate how important it was to see how my grandfathers and grandmothers got along do not underestimate how vital it was for us as kids to see how much they loved each other, to see how much dedication my grandfathers had to my grandmothers and vice versa, but especially in a world where all these men are leaving their women for younger 20 year olds, my grandfather certainly did not. My grandfathers spent every minute possible with my grandmothers within reason, of course, because one of my grandmothers was in a hospital. She had Alzheimer's, but they had a dedication to that relationship, raised kids together, went hell and back together, lived so many years together. And nothing was more beautiful than the way my grandparents were in love, regardless of how imperfect their pasts were together, no matter how much hurdles they had to overcome because the world they were raised in was horribly difficult. Like, remember my grandparents grew up in Iraq. Like, my grandparents were born in like, 1916 bro like they're dealing with a completely different relationship to reality my grandpa was like over 100 years old when he died my other grandpa was like almost 90 or 93 i think like these people are not just like they went through so much i couldn't even explain to you they weren't perfect but when they died they were very good people and something we have to remember is that even us we are working on ourselves to the moment we die and head to the next journey, whatever that is. Yo, Chad says grandpa wanted to volunteer for Canada in World War I. That's wild, bro. Not perfection. Another thing is this whole toxicity and dysfunctional thing and I'm leaving this person because they're toxic. You're going to be alone. Not you. I'm saying people. You're going to be by your damn self because let me explain something to you. If you get someone who's not toxic, it's because they're not human. In every relationship. That's what has, I was saying. Oh, oh wait. Yes. Oop, she better clarify clearly. Every relationship has some level of healthy dysfunction and some level of healthy toxicity. There's no way for you and I to cleave together, cleave together without doing some of this bumping. Right. It's not okay. going to work like that. Okay. Uh, okay. I agree with her so far. That there's always a level of two grown-ups making life together, which will bring, you know, disagreement and you will more move through those things without demeaning, without abusing, without demoralizing, without, you know, any of the negatives. But let's see, let's see. So we have to be okay with doing this, but the only recipe to a long-term successful relationship is to never leave, to never leave. That's the only way you can get 30. 
this is gonna, okay, if the wrong person hears this, they're gonna stay in an abusive relationship. And I just wanna say from my own, my own perspective, do not stay in a, do not stay in a toxic relationship. Do not stay in an abusive relationship. You do not have to do that emotional labor for somebody. So I just wanna, mm, yeah, okay, hold on, I'm seeing this. Yes, I don't throw around the word toxic. So based off of that, I don't personally agree. Toxicity, though, as an extreme, um, hold on, way of describing it healthier no. Yeah, 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 okay, okay, okay. I'm gonna say, Conflicts and disagreement make sense. Friction, I think, is a better word. Thank you, Michelle. Friction, all of that stuff will happen because you're two grownups making a, 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 a thing together. I think, but I, from a philosoph philosophical perspective, okay? So let's zoom out for a second. Man must face himself in moments of health and toxicity. And all people on a journey will have moments in life in which you are engaging in toxicity and yet you are still not a toxic person. Engaging in moments of being healthy doesn't make you a healthy person. Engaging in moments of toxicity doesn't make you a toxic person. That's why we say, hey, you're being pretty toxic right now. But on that spectrum of healthy to toxic, if you are in this, the side of it that is always toxic more than it is healthy, then you are just a toxic person who on occasion is healthy. You wanna be a healthy person who on occasion dips into your imperfect nature and has a moment of toxicity in which you catch yourself and you say, oh shit, I was being really toxic right there. Let me, let me pull back. I apologize to myself and to you. That was inappropriate. Let me bring myself back. Because we're all imperfect and we will have moments of anger we will have moments of sickness. I do this sometimes with my chronic illness where I'll be maybe engaging in toxic like self-talk where I'll be like, oh my God, this fucking stupid body. I fucking hate this body. And I'm like, that's pretty fucking toxic, bro. Let me, let me reel it back because it's negative energy. I'm bringing negative energy into my home. I accept that I am in pain. I accept that I want to cut off my arms thinking it will relieve this pain. But I will accept that even though I'm in this pain, I am still able to do work which is amazing. I'm still able to love, which is amazing. And I'm still able to be a good person, which is amazing. I am frustrated with this amount of pain. And I think frustration is a much more realistic and fair word than hating on this vessel that carries my consciousness. Much like Luffy says, you must love the ship that carries you because it's its own personality. Literally, it was written into one piece that the ships have souls. This body has a soul and it's carrying it right now and though this body is imperfect, it is good enough. But I'm still frustrated by it sometimes, but that is why you work and you meditate and you give it up to the universe, okay? So I don't like the word toxic in this particular instance, but I think friction, you know, having a moment, like I said, what did I say the other day? My partner and I on principle disagree at how long we should keep chicken nuggets in the oven. I really feel like 20 minutes is better. They get crispier, but 18 minutes is better. They get less dry. But I really feel like the crispiness needs to overcome the dryness because that's what the sauce is for. Yes, say. to never leave yeah. because we're going to go through some things. And there's going to be a lot of things that I say, this, this, this is it. This is the, this is the non-negotiable, <sighs> right? But mm -hmm. if I really am in it to be in it forever, like from the beginning, before I meet a man, I'm saying I, when I commit, I'm just doing this forever. That means I'm signing up and forgiving you before you do any of the bullshit you may come with. Are and they, that's challenging, but that's yeah. what real commit. I am willing to forgive you for any of the bullshit that you do, but that doesn't mean I'm going to stay in this marriage if you abuse me. So I want to make that clear. I I can work with people's faults. I think on our court in our courting relationship, we really put it all out there, like all the things that could be an issue in the marriage. And we said, you know, what our relationships are with handling it. We all have our own issues. But as long as it doesn't turn into abuse, I don't really care. It's abuse that's the problem. And sometimes I think this rhetoric makes people think what I need to put up with is abuse. So make sure you're defining abuse the same. My partner and I think cheating is abuse intimately talking to people in a way that crosses our boundaries is abuse. Going behind my partner's back and lying to him, keeping things from him is abusive in the same way that it is for me. If he does that to me, same thing. We have the same rules. We do not have different rules based off gender. Our gender doesn't matter like that. Gender does not play a role in this marriage. We have the same rules. We respect each other. We prioritize each other. We prioritize this marriage. We do not keep things from each other because there's no reason to marry somebody that I need to keep things from. I might as well stay single. Him and I lived perfectly decent single lives. We had great lives before. 
Why would we have given up a life that was perfect for a life that makes me feel like I can't voice myself? I will never be stifled in terms of my voice, whether single or married. Why would I have given up my voice to get married? Do I look like the Little Mermaid to you? Absolutely not, ma'am. Commitment is, commitment is I've, I'm going to do what I said I was going to do no matter how I feel. That goes back to what? Emotional intelligence. Right. Emotional intelligence is a nucleus to any healthy relationship. If I'm committing to you and you piss me off, I've committed to stay. So where am I going? Where am I going? Doesn't mean I can't take a break. Doesn't mean I can't take a pivot. I can't go to brunch. I can't meditate. Can I take a weekend of woosaw? But that means I'm not leaving you. And as an abandoned woman, thank God I've evolved into a place of deeper than just not leaving you, meaning leaving the relationship. But I've also had to learn to not leave you in this emotion of distraught because leaving you while you're in your emotion is the pit of abandonment. That's worse than me walking out and returning. Mm. I should be able to sit in this with you, upset or not upset until our emotions do whatever they're going to do. I mean, I, OK, again, like there are always going to be moments in a relationship where maybe like you you say something in a way that's kind of like you know, you move off defensiveness, let's say, because they said something that kind of like reminds you of something else that has nothing to do with them. And then you take a moment to sit down and calm down. Yes, in that moment, like, okay, I never think about leaving my marriage. But in my other relationships, I always thought about leaving. Anything that went wrong at any point, I went, I should leave. I should leave. I should leave. I should leave. My first thought was I should leave, not that we should figure this out. Now in my marriage, my first thoughts are, well, since I'm not leaving... I guess we'll figure this out. And it's always better when we do, but to be fair, we're not dealing with, we're not dealing with like, first we're not dealing with abuse and we're not even dealing with like full toxicity. We're dealing with old habits, right? Old habits die hard and it takes a lot of work to take away a habit, okay? I've got a lot of habits that I'm working on. He's got a lot of habits he's working on. And we give each other space to work on those habits. So if they come up again, it's about knowing that they're truly working on it. So you're not going to punish them for faulting on the habit. I think a lot of the time with couples, people say, I'm working on something, but then you can tell a person isn't, and then you punish them for it because they're not working on it. That's still not okay. You shouldn't be punishing your partners. But that's when intervention comes in. Since I know my partner and I are always working on it. We never have to feel like, oh, this person's not working on something, but we all have things because I was a whole ass person before I met him. He was a whole ass person before he met me. You know, we all come with baggage because we all come with history, but my baggage is my own and his baggage is his. And the best thing we can do for each other is cheerlead each other, support each other, never punish each other. And yes, no matter what, we don't leave this marriage because no matter what, we're not abusing each other. If we abuse each other, we both agree we're allowed to leave this marriage and it makes sense. Who am I to hold a person captive if I'm abusing them? Who is he to hold me captive under his abuse? An abuser. And no reason to listen to an abuser. No reason to stay married to one either. So she better be talking about a person who's having a bad day because they strained their hair and went outside and it was misty and now it's frizzy and it makes them panic because they remember being 10 years old and wanting their hair straight and they couldn't get it straight and they tried to chemically straighten it and it didn't work out. And no matter how hard they worked, they were never as pretty as these white girls with these beautiful straight hair. This has nothing to do with my childhood. I begged and begged my mom, my hair is a mess. And sometimes, and this is why we wear our hair natural now, sometimes you have a bad hair day and it has nothing to do with your partner. But sometimes it feels like you're 12 years old again and everybody's laughing at you and you feel ugly and stupid because everyone thinks you look, you look stupid. So you must be. It has nothing to do with him. But I appreciate the fact, let me tell you the way I have cried Never mind. I don't want to get into it. But let me tell you the way I've cried after a man has touched my hair and made me feel stupid. I don't even want to get started. Let me tell you this, though. The right person cheerleads you on and understands why you're in pain. And the right person doesn't take it out on their partner. Don't punish your partners. But don't say in abusive relationships either. And we get back to baseline.
Right. Because that's that is the epitome of deliverance. That's the epitome of commitment. Abandonment is, you know what? I can't deal with my emotions, so screw yours. I'm out of here. And when I feel I'm okay and I've regulated because I don't know how to do it, I'll come back. But it's still an emotional roller coaster, and abandonment is an emotional roller coaster. What I need you to do is sit with me in this until we, if it take a day or two weeks or five hours, don't leave me in my pain. Even if you're just my friend, don't sit with me in this. Now, if you gotta go to work, that's it, you know, <laughs> maybe I gotta go to work, but when I get back, let's continue to process this. But like you said, if it's an emotional intelligence scenario, at some point, if I've tried to reason with you mm -hmm. and you're still irate, right, or you're still non-compromising, I gotta let you sit in that and let you have that, and then hopefully, you know, on the, yes. another occasion, we can find some results. There you go. But you also have to, if it's someone you're you're already in a relationship with, and say you have already grown and evolved into your emotional intelligence, and they're just not there yet, then of course you kind of have to just wait it out, do a little deliverance, wait it out, do a, do a little deliverance, do what's best for you. But when you are, say, a person who's single or dating, you're not already in something that has been chaotic and there's some division and you're trying to atone or get that stuff to be jailed back, as a single person, you're learned, because I've learned when I was very hostile and I'm, I'm coming with it. Like I said, we come with who we are. Don't nobody give us nothing. So when I was already ready to come with it, I met men who gave me the reason to come with it. Now that I'm in a place where I'm like, I'm not going, I, not that I'm not going there with you because I have to try, I'm just not built like that no more. Right. And I don't have the desire to do that. Right. The men that I meet, and I'm dating, I'm single, but I'm dating. The men that I meet, they ain't perfect, but the conversation. She should date a woman. She would be great with a woman. Ugh, it would be a beautiful relationship. She needs a woman. She needs a woman who's just as femme as her, but just as dominant. Powerhouses, I'm telling you is more of a dialogue like this, Nick. There's, I, I have yet, literally yet, knock on wood because I don't want to, <clears throat> yelled or raised my voice at a man in the past three years I've been dating because of not the men, but because of you. what I'm calibrating and because my approach to a man is not like, I wish you would. No, it's now like, listen, we can talk this out, you know what I mean? Mm. Or we don't have to, but I'm not going to do this with you. And and I and I very much I think you can tell by my personality I very much stand on my square and I very much stand on business. <laughs> yeah, so thanks. I don't have to emasculate you for you to know I stand on business because more men have said, mm. "Damn, you ain't no joke." By me saying, "Listen, do we want to have resolve right now?" Yeah. Because I'm not about to do this with you. And you see a man's whole everything. I'm shift like like who who got, the hell is she? Like right. what just okay? Wait, but there's something here that I think is important. It depends on the bubble. This is so heavily, I don't know what bubble she's in exactly. Like, I don't know if she's even a straight or queer. She's probably straight, I'm assuming. Sometimes I think men and boy, men in um, red pill bubbles and then red in like, um. oh my God, Brittany. The men and women bubbles that aren't the, like the whatever podcast or red pill or some toxic form of heterosexuality. Sometimes I think they think they're in competition with their partner. So everything feels like disrespect when a woman is independent or a man is more a little, let's say, less independent or something like that is happening. But the thing is, like, you're not in competition with your spouse because you're on the same team. You're not in competition with the people on your team, right? Like, that's a, that's a bad. Don't do that. So I would never think to emasculate my partner. I would never think to diminish my partner. I would never think to talk down to my partner. I would never think, even if I'm, a, like, if my partner and I are, like she said earlier, like, sometimes your partner is at a different level, you always want to be within a reasonable place of your partner. You don't ever want to outgrow your partner. So you better reach down and grab your partner by the hand and pull them up and they better do the same to you. And as one grows, the other follows and vice versa. We grow at our own paces, but we we pay attention to where our partner is because we're a team. But you don't, you don't have to emasculate. You don't have to demonize. You don't have to dehumanize. When you come to your partner, you come to your partner with great love. Like one of the things I've noticed about my partner is Anytime he notices something that I'm doing that's like not the greatest, like maybe it's not within my balance because, you know, you're never perfectly in balance. But let's say I'm out of balance a little bit and he comes to me and says like, hey, uh, you out of balance. I don't sit there and like get defensive like what? <laughs> what? I sit there and go, oh, hold on. Yeah, maybe I think I might be. Yeah, I think I might be a little bit out of balance. He's like, cool, you should go meditate. He's right. 
And when I go to him and I say, hey, are you out of balance today? He goes, let me think about, it. yeah, actually, wait, it's like 4 p.m. And I'm totally just noticed. Yeah, thanks for pointing it out. Because we're both neurodivergent queens. We're going to forget. We're going to space. We both have our deficiencies. And so we rely on each other to be like, hey, are you out of balance? No judgment. All love. And then they go, thanks. Love you. And I go, yeah. It is all love. And to be fair, since we're all people who can get our feelings hurt, there's obviously respect with how and when you say it. You don't have to nag. You have to talk. You don't have to wait your turn to talk. You can listen. It's okay to be out of balance, but it's also okay to get back on balance or to have somebody you trust to say, hey, out of balance. And our secret word is meditate which is probably like going to church for some people, you know? We're like, meditate, meditate. Deep breaths, deep breaths. We're helping each other. We're never lecturing or hindering. It's always to help. And remember the road to hell is paved in good intentions. And sometimes your good intentions, even for your spouse, can be bad. So check in with your spouse and trust them to tell you what's up, right? What's happening right now? Because like you said, they're not used to that. I want to touch on that for a second because you bring up some great points, but even specifically to the, the single women that are watching mm -hmm. and, and they, they, they see you as a strong example. They see the empowerment they see. Um, but I mean, at the end of the day, how, or what would be your advice or your insight to, I mean, cause you are, you are a single woman as well. And, Hope to is the desire to get married eventually? It is. I'm in my choosing. I just I said four or five months ago, I said, okay, God, I'm in my choosing stage. I'm not gonna call up another wedding because the commitment in me is different. So and, 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 and you, I'm like you said, you've had that. you've I'm had excited. plans did not go as oh yeah, the I've been plan. yeah, I've called off two engagements and two weddings and yeah. Two saved. separate times? So that's four? Two separate times. Damn. Yeah, two separate times. Wait, God. but how old was she and was she in her toxic era? Because she, if she was in her toxic era, that's one thing. But in her healthy era, has she done that? Because that's crazy. If somebody said to me, oh, I'm super healthy, but I called off two engagements during that era, I'd be like, mm, mm. so I need to know, was this during her toxic era? All right. So mm -hmm. so you know what you want. You, and you're going you're gonna to get what you want when you want it. What is your insight and advice to finding this mm -hmm. husband out there? I think it's to, to be completely open. I think it's to not be a stiff blade of grass. A stiff blade of grass, I say it in my book, Mental Detox is a dying blade of grass. Oh, write it down, ladies. Mental Detox. Let's read it and judge it. I love reading and judging. Meaning you have to not personalize life, but you have to live life. And you have to be okay with getting experiences without judging yourself as a woman based on what those experience are, whether the experience is a week or a month or a year and it doesn't work, you gotta be able to give fully what you wanna give and what you wanna invest without feeling like you were robbed in the event it doesn't work. Because the feeling of robbery then dissipates you and your value and makes you question who you are and put you in a doubtful space. And if we're talking about law of attraction, you can't attract high functioning from a place of low vibration. So you have to make sure that you- Oh, she's jumping into different bubbles. These are like different specific bubbles. So she must be in the Robert Greene bubble. So the self-help bubble. She is a therapist, PhD. So she's also in the mental health bubble. So she's in the coaching bubble, but she's also in the medical bubble. Interesting. She's in a lot of them. Yeah, because even like law of attraction and all that stuff, like that's a very specific bubble and that's a very specific belief system. And I think that that's true. Like you have to be healthy to attract healthy. I think it takes two to be in a toxic relationship. Like you must be toxic enough to be in it. Healthy people dating toxic people break up after a few dates because they see a pattern, right? It's like, or healthy people are incredibly blindsided, have no pattern awareness or recognition. And then all of a sudden they're tricked by sort of the toxic person. That's a possibility too. But she's definitely like coming from a very particular place. I want to hear her say values. I want to hear her say lifestyle. I want to hear her say a lot of things. But I will tell you this. She seems like a person who would be very happy or should be very happy single. If she settles in a relationship, I feel like she'll be miserable. I think most people are miserable because they settle. They settle on values. They settle on their happiness. They're so terrified of being alone. They settle for somebody they look at funny every day. 
And I do not want her to wake up looking at somebody funny every day. You understand that life is not doing nothing to Oh, good point. I think she's speaking the language that Nick prefers as well. Ooh, good point, good point. You is doing it for you. It's meant to be lived and not personalized and be okay with your experiences. And for the women who are of up in age, when I say up in age, you could be in your 30s and you're not married yet and you are in your career or you're trying to figure things out. Make yourself talk, talk, talk question, not be why am I not married yet? Let yourself talk question and dialogue be I'm proud of myself that I didn't choose out of despair mm. that I allowed myself as a woman to choose on my terms, on my time and when I felt like it, because when you do it like that, mm. then it's more up to work. So yep. When you when she says despair and I say settling, like when you choose out of loneliness, out of despair, you end up to being what was her name? Tessa? T Tessa? What was her name? Who the fuck did I marry? You married out of loneliness and despair. You married out of convenience. And girl, we got a great TikTok series out of it. And you got a great career, but let's not do that again. Because there's a pressure in some bubbles to be married by a certain age. Again, shout out to my parents who never pressured their kids to get married by a certain age. Risa Tisa. Thank you, Risa Tisa. Shout out to Risa Tisa. Very important. Very biggest blessing my parents ever gave me and all of my siblings was not to get pressure to get married because God forbid you marry the wrong person. God forbid you marry the wrong person. Your life will be hell. And my mother should know she married the wrong person initially. And it did. It brought a lot of suffering into very, like very many people's lives. Okay. I'm Lexi. Talk about the difference. My mom married the right person. So my parents are together right? But my two older brothers, my mom married the wrong person and made them. But to be fair, they had been with my dad for a really long time. They consider him like their dad and everything. But there is still an impact. They still have a story that's different from mine, even though we're siblings. And I consider my brothers, my brothers, a hundred percent, right? A thousand percent, right? I don't give a fuck if they have a different genetic dad at some point. Who fucking cares? They're my brothers, right? But that still doesn't take away from the fact that they have a different story than I do. I don't have a story that my dad chose a life away from me. But they do. And then they have a story where a dad chose to be in their life too. They get two stories, but I see the impact that it, it had on them, you know? So take your time and do you and don't personalize it because you have a lot of people who already been married a few times that right. could easily be you but for the people who have been married a few times and do have kids and they're co-parenting i would say that number one two get your emotional intelligence up if you don't have a therapist and you can't afford it read books on it youtube mm -hmm. has free videos on emotional intelligence and the best way to implement knowledge because knowledge is not power the implementation of knowledge is power is to go out there and experience it so for like myself I had to date and get into conflict with men so that I can use my emotional intelligent tool. And I remember when I first tra started trying to use it, I'm like, damn, I, I totally messed that up. I blew that. <laughs> <laughs> like, I totally blew that, right? right. I, I didn't mean to, to emasculate him, but damn, I didn't mean to come off that straw. I blew that up. But now it's to the point where it's on autopilot. Yeah. And I know the dialogue and I know the level of relationship I want. And then two, don't, don't knock yourself for showing up in ways that go against your ideology. Right. And be open to dating someone who is outside of your norm of what you think he should be. Mm. Because what you think he should be is based on what you've already experienced. Yeah. And if what you experience is what you want, baby, go back. Yeah. But if not, be open to it. Now, and let yourself be full woman, full feminine, full that. You don't, you know, I'm out. I mean, I always say I'm hybrid, meaning I'm alpha submissive because I'm yeah. definitely alpha, but I'm definitely submissive. And I couldn't be with a man that I couldn't be submissive with. Like if my alpha is always in prone with you, yeah. then I, I don't, I like submitting. I like loving you, on you. you hit. Okay. So she knows herself. She knows the dynamics she wants. She knows the type of energy she wants in the relationship. I think she's right to want an openness of what a person looks like. And I think that's important, but it's good to know that she knows her balance. Yeah. See, I, I think that's so good to know about yourself because, um, yeah, like, I think that's just, just a powerful thing to know whatever it's going to be like, oh yeah, like I don't need to feel submissive in a relationship, but somebody might need to. And that's going to be a big difference between how you're compatible. Compatibility is also about energy and value. So value is important. Your belief systems, how you're going to move through life. 
but also your relationship with each other separate from the world, right? Is what is the expectation of our dynamic when we're engaging with each other? Some people want to feel small, I think is one way that we talk about it, is I want to feel small with my partner. Um, and I think it's good for both people to want to feel that way. It's another way of saying I want to feel vulnerable or I want to feel safe enough to be not like a child, that's the wrong word, but like small, vulnerable, not need to square up. You know what I'm saying? So I think that's good that she really knows that about herself. And that's, you know, to be fair, depending on the bubble, look, there's 8 billion people on the planet, but those that are eligible and those are that are going to vibe with her, they're there. The question is, where does she meet them? Because she's going to need a very, she's going to need a man who likes being a man, but isn't defined by being a man in that way, I think. Like she's going to need a man who's a man, but a man who's a man who isn't going to feel threatened by her being alpha in any capacity. A man who's in any way threatened that his woman is successful is a man who will not be able to be with her. You know, it won't work. She'll, she's too smart. And a lot of men will feel small next to her, but in a bad way, mm, in a bad way, because it will like bring out their insecurities. You want to feel small in a good way. Not small in a bad way. Exactly where I want to go. So in this, because even in, in the way you conduct yourself, um, even the, the intellect and the, and the wisdom that you, you possess, it comes off very alpha and probably is intimidating to a lot of men. And then so either you're, you find yourself being combative with another alpha <laughs> or you find yourself overtaking uh, a man that is can't match that energy. I love that. I love that you said that my last fiance was pity me of alpha, just mm. alpha, alpha, no beta, alpha. Mm. And um, it actually showed me submissive sides of me that I didn't know exist that I fell in love with. Mm. And so when you're with an alpha who's a true alpha, there is safety there. And Everything about your femininity, about your submissiveness will arise and everything about your alpha dormants naturally. And so we didn't have an alpha battle because it was something about his true alpha essence that turned me on so much that I wanted to stay in my feminine. This is not my bubble. This is not my bubble in there. It's not my bubble. But, you know. Mm, mm, mm. Him so that mm. he can stay in the balancing right of alpha. Because had I moved to alpha to alpha, yeah. we, would, we wouldn't have been equally yoked. Does yeah, that yeah, make yeah. sense? Either no, he would have had to go beta to or we would have yeah. done this. And his alphaness, because it was the first time I was with a true alpha man, was so attractive to me that from the kitchen to the bedroom, it made me wide open submissive in ways right. that I didn't even, I Believe remember saying were. I wouldn't, don't want to do them things. Like, I don't want to disrespect her decision because it's hers and as long as it flows, it's good. Yeah, this is, I, you know, to be fair, <laughs> it's not, it's, it's the language she's probably using that is a little like annoying maybe to this bubble. But at the same time, like, I think it's really good for her to use the language that translates what she's trying to say to others and attract that kind of person i i think again i th i think alpha and beta works really well when you're talking about um a particular bubble and maybe gender playing a huge role you know what i mean so i really like that for her isn't that amazing though we really do live in different bubbles like all of us have a different perception of how we see our relationships so I don't think she's talking about like Andrew Tay red pill bubble alpha. I think she's talking about a dominant partner who allows her to feel submissive in a way that makes her feel safe. And also like in her high femininity, I'm not a high femme partner. So that's different, right? If you're a high femme partner, you probably want that. A lot of the girls I know who are high femme, they want to feel like, Ooh, my man is so strong. And my man is like, Oh my God, he could break me in half if he wanted to. There's some element of that that's hot to them. And I love that. Um, that's not my bubble, but you know what? Like shout out. If that's what you're into girl, you do you, you know what I'm saying? As long as it's healthy, I don't give fuck. You know, I don't give fuck. And I yeah. started saying, when are we going to do them things yeah, again? Right, right, right. <laughs> because I was so in my feminine. And let me say this ladies and Nick, that one experience may have not worked, but that is what ignited my femininity. See, that's crazy for her to be engaged to somebody and break it off. I still got to know, is that when she was healthy? 
Because that's wild to me to say yes to marriage to somebody you're not sure about. That is wild to me. So you better have an excuse or an explanation, like not an excuse, but an explanation. Like I was in my toxic, it was a bad judgment because like, how do you say, yeah, you know what I'm saying? That's part, that part's a little confusing to me, but I also believe in like certain people are made for you belief. I think there's millions of them, but I think like there are people on the planet made for you to be high compatibility. And those are the people you say yes to. You don't say yes to the people that are 70% compatible. You don't say yes to the people that are 65% compatible. You don't settle for 20% compatible. A lot of people will settle. You'll see those couples who should have broken up, but they're announcing they're pregnant with a baby who are like 10% compatible. Also, uh, who said it? Top and bottom is another good way to, I think, phrase it. I think, see, yeah, I think that's probably good too. Like not everybody wants to be like toppy in their relationships. Like I'm in a good like switch relationship. So it works out really well. Where like none of us are interested in being the top full time. That sounds exhausting. Nobody wants, I don't want to do that. But also we just flow with the energy. It's not about who's doing what. It's about what we're doing in the natural, the natural state of things. I want it to be natural. We don't have to discuss what's happening. We know what's happening. We can feel the, the air switch. You know, we don't, it's just the energy, bro. So for me, I think I, I like translating it into that language, top and bottom, but alpha and beta, it's fine. We can, we, we'll jump into the bubble. We'll use her language. Me and me. And from there, Nick, I've never gone back. Like every man that I've calibrated right. has been in his alpha that has allowed me to stay in, in, my, in my submissiveness. Okay. Does that make sense? And so it's the law. That it man is. was so pivotal in shifting my calibration for right. me that even though it didn't work, that was a blessing in itself. Mm -hmm. There it is. Okay, so as we wrap up, get into your business just a little bit, <laughs> if, if you don't mind. Yeah. Because, I mean, you, you're sharing a lot. You already done beat me up for <laughs> session after session. So I got, I mean, as, as transparent and as candid as you would like to be, mm -hmm. you've, you said, like, literally, there's been four times that you've almost went down the <laughs> altar. And, I almost went down. Yeah, see? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, take, you're taking the long walk. I'm making that long haul. Why hasn't it worked? And whose oh. fault is it? Because you've been talking about accountability. Yeah. You've been talking about high functioning. And you literally told me that I'm probably in my mm -hmm. situation because of the type of high function. Hold on, hold on. Ania said four. I think he's counting the engagements and the weddings. But here we go. This is going to be the good stuff. Okay, ready? Who, girls? Let's see. Mm -hmm. the low functioning people I'm choosing. Yep. Why hasn't it worked for you? Because I was, for the first few, I was low functioning. And I was still mm. in my healing journey. And so I law of attracted low functioning. And in the first, you're saying that, the, that happened all four or just the first? The first, I would say like the first two or three. Two. Definitely okay. low functioning. Of my oh, is she talking about four different people? Is she talking about engagements or just serious relationships, which is fair. And also shout out to her for saying that she was in her low functioning, meaning her toxic era. We love to see it because that is a good reason to recognize like, okay, I called off something that could have ruined me for the rest of my life and I had the wisdom not to do it. Self, so and when I, you say that, cause I want you to break that down, like what were you desiring? How were you low functioning that found things that, where you yeah. thought this was your match, this was your person yeah. and then it still didn't. Oh damn, four people, two engagements, two weddings. Okay, got you. So, Go for, cause so you were low I take accountability was my fault because I knew all of them were not my person mm -hmm. from oh. the beginning. Nice. Oh, fire. I love her, bro. I love her. So and it, there is a person. There's yeah. one person mm. out there for you. Um, I don't think there's one person. I think that there's many people yes. that are for everyone. Mm. I think that is just so you're a type of person, you're a person that's on yeah, your frequency, the type of person that you feel I want to do. I want to do this with you forever. I think it, it, that's your person. If that right. happens four okay. or five times, hey, that's amazing. <laughs> right. You know, for me, I knew that I didn't want to do any of them forever, not because they weren't great men. I knew, I knew subconsciously that I was choosing because they were what I needed for that season. Oof. Um, and I, you know, got caught up in, we're here, this man is amazing, faithful as hell, loves me, takes full care of me, even though I'm in my own professional field. Um, and so I learned not to thrive, but to survive in that. And because I'm a little girl who grew up surviving and not thriving, mm. I didn't understand what thriving was yet. And so I allowed my my th my survival mechanism and my lack of sense of self, right, and a lot and my brokenness to choose what it needed there. And because it chose something that allowed me to stay broken, I stayed longer. Does that Oof. make sense? Because what this is so fuck. I'm sorry to interrupt her, but you know, she's, this is everything. 
I'm going to use this language, I think, when I tell my stories is that, you know, you choose what you need in the moment. And in the moment, I needed it. And then the moment finished and I also was done. It is so good because it is definitely the game changer for me myself, what I learned in my life, which was you're good for a season, but bro, I cannot see you in the future. This is not my person. Your person isn't one person, but it is the one person you're going to choose to do life with. And I've only, to be fair, only met one person that I thought was one of those many people. And I chose him and we chose each other and we said yes, because he agrees. My partner also agrees that within his lifetime, I'm the first of the people that he feels like, oh, you're one of them. You want to do it? And I'm like, yeah, for sure, bro. High five, bump uglies, get married. Like we did it and we feel really good about it. We're like, we feel like best friends. We feel good about everything. But we know there are other people in the universe that would have been just as good, but we're never going to know who they are because we're never going to get to know them that way. And that's the difference. I am never looking out into the universe and thinking, who's the other person that I would have been compatible with? I don't care. In this lifetime, we are not talking because I already found that one person. Now, God forbid if either of us die, right? There might be another opportunity to meet one of those people, but while we are married and while we are thriving and while this team is building itself, we'll never know who those other people would have been because we don't intimately talk to other people that way. It took us talking intimately for us to realize we were that person for each other. So the only other reason I would know that person is out there is if I talk to somebody else intimately in a way that would be considered cheating in this marriage that we don't engage with, right? Nick Cannon and all these other people, sometimes I feel like they are, to be fair, negotiated. They negotiated this lifestyle with their partners. But some of these people who have not, who are supposed to be monogamous, sometimes y'all are looking for people you shouldn't even be looking for. Allegedly, if you found your person. And I think to be fair, if you found your person, you won't be looking. I think sometimes people that are looking when they're in a marriage are slightly admitting to themselves that they settled. What they were feeding me, which was allowing me to be toxic, allowing me to be dysfunctional in that relationship, and even allowing me sometimes to be abusive, even if it was verbally, in that relationship without fleeing, because these men were not fleers, without fleeing or at least saying, hold on, you know, we got to, this is not cool, we got to figure this out. It was just, I love you. And like you were saying about these babies being number one, you can run amok. And I'm going to be right here for the muck two or three. Mm -hmm. That may be what we want coming from abandoned little control freaks, but that ain't what we need. Mm. And so when I had that, all it did was inflame the dysfunction. Ooh, great, great comments. It's not saying she had to marry these people, um, but why not just hold off until you get to a healthier point and see if it's uh, to see it's not there yet. Um, sometimes you can't get healthier until you break up with the wrong person. Like if you're with the wrong person, because look, it doesn't matter how unhealthy you are. If you're right with the right person, you're with the right person. It doesn't matter how healthy you are. If you're with the right person, you're with the right person. But if you're with the wrong person, you're with the wrong person. This is what I believe. This is a personal belief. So if you're with the right person, then your story will be, they stayed by my side while I got healthier. If you're with the wrong person, the conversation will be, I stayed unhealthy for all of my life because I couldn't get myself out when I needed to get out. Even though this person wasn't unhealthy, they were with me, so they must be a little bit of toxic. Let's be real. At some point, if you're dating a person who's very toxic and unhealthy like she says she was, you are too. Maybe not to the same degree, but you are enough to stay in a relationship where your partner isn't getting better. For me, my breakups always made me better. I always got better through my relationships because I learned a lesson that the universe was sending me through those relationships. And once I learned the lesson, I never turned back. But in order to learn that lesson, you have to break it off. Because if it's your person, then your story will be different than the one that she had, the one that I had. That was not our story. I knew a really great couple, been married over 40 years, really healthy relationship, started off where she was in a more toxic place than him, stabilized, became a team, does life together in a great marriage, great relationship. But to be fair, she was ready to stop being toxic. And the moment she was ready to be stop being toxic, she ran into this guy who had already fought his demons. And together, they built what they now are, the successful team, right? But it's about timing. And it's about the person that the person is at the time that you meet them. I think you are who you are at the time that you exist. The Britney that you're going to know tomorrow is different than the Britney today, even if they feel similar. 
The Brittany I'll be at 41 is going to be different than the Brittany I am today. I can't wait to meet her. I can't wait for you guys to meet her because she won't be the one you're looking at right now. So my partner and I, had we met five years earlier, five years later, we would have been different people. Same people to a lot of people, but different people. So we wouldn't have been compatible. I guarantee you, we joke about, like I always say, like, where were you at 25? Where was I at 25? What were you doing this year? What were you doing in 2002? What were you doing in 2006? Where were you? And then we'll sit here and we'll laugh. I'm like, where were you when this happened? And we'll talk about all these lives we had before meeting each other that all are the reason we became the people that we are today to match up in the first place. We had to be who we were. We were. So why didn't she stay with these people until she was healthy to see what there was? Because there was never going to be anything. And that I was. Right. Luckily, I was able to look in the mirror and say, hold on. I'm looking at all this inflammation. I don't want this for what me and my husband. I don't want this for my kids. I don't want this for me as a woman. I don't want this for my other relationships. And then when I pulled out other relationships, I... Oh, hold on. There's always someone better out there in some metric. Absolutely not. You're not talking about the same thing. You are not talking about what I'm talking about. Elizabeth and Darcy were perfect for each other. There's nobody more perfect for Elizabeth than Darcy. If Darcy doesn't exist, then there's somebody who's good enough and matches with Elizabeth. But that is not what we're talking about. There is not always someone better for you unless you are completely using a different metric that like we are not using. So yes, on some metric, if you're like, there's a girl with bigger boobs out there. Sure, if that's your metric for a relationship. But we are not talking about that. We're talking about healthy, similar values, person who was made for you in the universe out of many. And we're talking about living a life with that person, having a significant relationship with a person. This is a significant relationship that will be very deeply meaningful. Not the ones that you did in your 20s to learn your lessons. Not the ones you had in your 50s that taught you how to like survive. Not the ones, the one that makes people make art, that makes poetry get written. The one that is healthy enough to stand the test of time. It cannot be exchanged out for some metric of better when the better is the consciousness you're meeting. I cannot replace the consciousness that is my partner. There is only one of him and there's only one of you. You cannot re be replaced based off a metric. I can never replace you. I can only ask you to do life with me. And since we're doing life together, we're doing that together. But I cannot replace somebody who exists in the same way that I cannot replace a blade of grass with another and call it the same. It is different. I uh, ended up doing a lot of looking at myself. So over this four years I've been single, I have said no before the ring. I've said no mm. at the conversation of, I would love to marry you. I didn't say <laughs> no bluntly, but I said, right. look, that's, that's not something I'm ready for now. Right. Maybe we could take a little slow. But in four years, and, and I say this with all humility, I promise all humility, <laughs> all humility, whatever it is that I calibrate, whatever it is in me, whatever uh, daddy issues my father made sure I did not have, right. there's something about me, I'm not joking, that calibrates really good men who are ready to get married. And so this is why I say it's not their fault right. because these men wouldn't know infidelity. I mean, it's nobody's fault. It's just like you're not compatible. Right. These men weren't a beat, wasn't, you know, they weren't beating on me. Yeah. I attract good men, but I wasn't in the space of. Yeah, I don't think even if she was in the space, they would be her partner. Of being ready to marry them because I needed them to be good. That's a big step too, though. Yeah. Because like, you're talking but about I needed them to be good. But yeah. I needed them to be good for me, Nick, because I needed something good to be reflected on me, if that makes sense, for my healing journey. Right. And so once I was able to see that, I'm able to go into, okay, this is what I know I need to do. And there's a lot of checkmating of my Hold on. You said, I don't know, maybe they're ready to marry her. You can't marry somebody who doesn't want to marry you. Like you can't marry someone who is, doesn't want to, it's a, that's a one-sided relationship. That's unrequited love. That isn't a teammate. That's somebody you hope changes so they be with you. Wanting to be with somebody who doesn't want to be with you is not a relationship. It's just a lie. Myself. There's a lot of ways I refuse to ever show up with a man. There's a lot of mm, alpha things that I would never say or do with a man because 
of me calling off. And because of those. And also her relationship stories aren't different from mine just because I had toxic relationships. And I'm like, of course they ended. They would have been the wrong relationship if they were healthy. Ending a relationship isn't bad. It's not your person. Her reasons for dumping perfectly decent men is the same reason you dump toxic ones. They're not your person. This idea of I'm a good guy. Why won't she marry me? Look, I'm ready to get married. As if that was all it took. As if that's all it took. You know, that's the thing. Now I'm saying she said she attracts men who are ready to get married, but I'm just compliment, con, compli, compliment, complimenting that maybe she's just a great woman. I mean, maybe. I mean, lots of people want to get married. I don't know. The idea of like, oh, they're ready to get married. It's like, hmm. I don't know. It depends on what metric we're using to judge. It depends on the bubble too. Like she said, don't settle in her own language, which I agree with. Hmm. Okay. Let's wrap it up. She's almost done. She's, she'll tell us. Those men being amazing enough to stick through my BS right. and let me run amok. But they were, this is, say it again, with all respect, they were like buffers. And it's mm. not in a bad way. I'm saying they were those buffers that were just yeah. sturdy oaks. And from an abandoned little girl, what do you think we need most? We need someone who's going to be a sturdy oak. You never leave. Yeah. You never leave, no matter what I put you through. Right? No matter how toxic I am, you ain't going <laughs> to leave. No matter how many times I flee, you ain't going to leave. Mm. So then maybe, mm. I mean, again, because there's... there's mm. Mm. I mean, I guess as a person with borderline personality disorder who's in remission, I will say that I felt abandoned by my parents, but then I realized my parents wouldn't leave. So I think I got a lot of healing through my parents rather than a relationship. I think I learned this lesson through my parents and not love. So ironically enough, my parents, my therapist think I was pre-abandoning by being, um, gay, right? And so my parents abandoned me, but then I think I healed that abandonment through my parents. Everything she just described, my parents did for me. No matter how much I yelled, no matter how much I tantrumed, no matter how much I like slammed doors and left, no matter how much I left and came back, no matter how much they always unconditionally loved me. And I think I learned that healing through my relationship with them. I remember when I left my last relationship and I went home to my parents. I went home to my parents. And I said, I think I really fucked up. I think I really hit the end of my fucked upness. And they had met the person and they knew he wasn't my person. My dad told me. They're like, he's batty. He's a loser. And I was like, I know. My greatest crime was loving losers. And I was loser enough to love them. I know. I went home to my parents and I cried in their arms and then I rebuilt my life and I realized in that moment, no matter how many times I had yelled at my parents, gone upset with my parents, they loved me unconditionally. It didn't matter because they knew I was only yelling at them because I was in pain, not because I was evil and not because I didn't love them. I was crying out in pain. And I think that healed me. And it also made it so my life wasn't uh, dictated by like a man or a woman. I didn't need a partner to love me when I was loved by the people who created me. Maybe not God, but my parents, right? Welcome to the memberships ASMR. Welcome, welcome. There's a lot of women out there that are who feel Sorry. Which is why it is so important if you're going to become a parent to unconditionally love your kids if it is within you. Okay? Because biology plays a role in this. But to unconditionally love your kids, to deeply want to be a parent, is to give your kids a love they will take with them till the day they die and after. The greatest gift my parents ever gave me was unconditional love. Because they loved me even when I was ugly and never needed me to do anything in return to earn that love. When you're in a romantic relationship with somebody, they can unconditionally love you, but they might need to put down boundaries in a way that means they can't be with you. And that's very hard to realize. But your parents, they don't have the dynamic with you. That means they have to put down those kinds of boundaries that are quite the same. They still put down boundaries. Doesn't mean they have to have you in your life. They still can love you from afar, but it's very different because your life, your parents don't do life with you, but your partners do. 
The sacrifice I'm asking for my partner versus my parents is I'm not asking my parents to do life with me. I'm saying, love me unconditionally, even though we don't do life together. And I'm saying to my partner, I love you unconditionally, whether we do life or not together, but I'm asking you to do life with me. I'm asking you to do life with me. And the way, obviously, that one caveat to us doing life together would be abuse. God forbid I ever abuse you. Please feel free to divorce me. Okay, so I'm just... So that their independence is so strong that they don't need a man in their experience. Mm. So like what, again, as I tap into my fatherhood, I'm, I'm telling, my, <laughs> telling my daughter, like, yeah. you, you can have one if you want one. So my dad used to tell me, baby, he gave me a ring on my ring finger at 16 and said, beautiful, whole lot of diamonds. Like, don't take it off to a man gives you a ring. Well, I've had four of them. But he also <laughs> said, baby, you know, you're successful. You're a powerhouse. You ain't got to marry but I explained to him, Daddy, but I am... So why I am, does a strong woman want to marry? Um, because it, it, does, it does give some um, completion to the completion, if that makes sense. For me, I want to birth, I want to be a mom. So that's important to me, right? But I want right. a family, not just kids. Otherwise, I can adopt. Obviously, I can financially afford it. Yeah. But, um, and I want that family dynamic. You want a, the traditional household. I want the traditional household. Um, will it look like tradition? Maybe not. Right. Uh, I think for me, being a successful woman, the biggest thing has been and the biggest conversation with my father and I and my uncle Montel is, Shy, what if you make more than him? Are you okay with that? Mm. Because there was a time where I wasn't okay with it. Mm. And now I've gotten to a place where I do so well, you know, that Ooh. I'm saying, well, if he does make a little so, less, so you, but he can, so you but, can but get he a can bus provide. Driver and a janitor a shot. You know, if <laughs> if the janitor owns a janitorial company. Oh, see, now he got to own the whole damn he owns, company. But this he is can't the thing. even be a good Let janitor. Me say this. Let me say this. It doesn't matter how much more I make than him. If he can provide for us and provide a quality of life for us, I, I don't really give but it. But you, I don't you, care. The, you the one that's doing that for myself. I don't think, no, 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 I disagree. You said, and she is, I don't think this is, I don't think this is toxic. I think it's specific. I know a lot of women who want, who have jobs, who are college educated, who make like 30K a year, and they want a man who makes like 100K so they can live a good lifestyle, but they don't want to give up their art. I think it's necessary for all the teammates to do what's necessary to make the life they want possible. And I think genuinely, if, if she wants a specific lifestyle, then her partner does have to be somebody who can comply with that. And I don't think that's wrong. I don't think it is wrong to want a specific like lifestyle and to say that the chances of me meeting somebody who's at this lifestyle won't be cohesive with that lifestyle. Like that's not upsetting to me. I think if it's gender-based and it's other things that I'm like raising an eyebrow, I think what's important is that she has an idea for what she wants and I think she's allowed to date somebody who has that, like, that standard, right? But also, I think if she's not willing to settle, but she's not just dating him because of that money, she's dating somebody who agrees with her lifestyle, then that makes sense. It's like a, it's like a dink, double income, no kids. You know, you can't have a dink relationship unless you're both making money, right? So if you have a dream of having a dink relationship, then that means both of you are making money. And if she is the relationship where like she is making money, she is very good. I don't know what she means by making money for herself though. That confused me. Yeah, Conrad says his money is ours and our, my money is mine. If that's her mentality, then I think that's super toxic and not a team player. But let's see, because if she says like, I'm making my money for me, what does that mean? Because that's where I'm like, oh, what does that mean? Yeah, because there's nothing wrong with her expecting a man to have a certain standard or a person. What does that part mean? Because my money is my money. My money is his money. Our money is our money, right? I'm more of a Dave Ramsey kind of bubble where I grew up like your money is my, my mom's money is my dad's money. My dad's money is my mom's money. It doesn't matter who makes money. 
Okay, it doesn't matter if one person makes money or both people make money. Our money is our money. There is no, it is one pile of money. So that's how I want to live my life. Like it's our money. We talk to each other about our money. It's our money. It doesn't matter who makes it. So let's see if she she answers that because I want to know. But if you're at, you're family. clearly at and a level family. where you can take care family. like so he don't necessarily got to so put and he could be a provider so and a protector without financial. take care of my man financial. financially? Yeah. I don't for me personally I wouldn't only because it would put me too much in an alpha space. Would, y'all would and, be equally yoked. And then I don't know how much my old norm would not come out. And because that, that I I mean, mm, that's hard. Uh, okay, look, I'm gonna let her talk for a second. Hold on. I know respect myself, that we be uh, yeah, respect. searching for when we enter the house with and When it. you say daddy's home, that means more than just your home. <sighs> Damn. In your present. So now me. you just narrowed your for circle me. so much smaller because oh, now oh, you trust got me. you got to have a high functioning, high value. Yes. yes. Like, and let me tell you something though. Rich ass man. <laughs> or at least if he ain't rich, he got to be doing something that makes. And I'm saying rich, he just has to be rich in spirit. This is rich what I've learned. In, in, this is what I've learned. I've learned that it's not the amount of money that someone makes that creates the quality of life. Because I have constituencies that make way less and way more than me. Right. And my constituents that make way more, I'm talking about extra, extra uh, nomically more than me, yeah. I live the same quality of life they do. So you just want somebody with so, some initiative and some aspirations no, so and I'm dreams. No, I'm 41. And... So somebody who, he ain't... I'm, oh, is he done dreaming? He, he ain't, he's, I mean, if Can he be a younger man? He may have to because I want a man with no kids because I want my own family. You want a so, man with no so, kids? So go down, go down, go down, Nick, This nigga Nick, ain't out go, there. Go you looking down, for Nick, Jesus. Go, yes. And he, he, he still ain't came back. Can we please? Okay. <sighs> okay. No judgment. Right? Um, no judgment. <laughs> I got to start putting my chat on screen cuz you guys are so funny. I really got to start putting my chat on screen. Um, I know this is where a lot of us are deviating. Even LJ says, hey, we all have our weaknesses. Like, look, I really like her. She's so right on so much. She's not wrong. I think women like this need a space. I meet a lot of women like this and they are single. But they're not single because they're picky. They're signal single because I don't know if she knows why she wants this. Right? Like, I don't know. I would ask her why this is important. Right? Because... I'll be honest, as the breadwinner in my family, as somebody who makes the money, it does put me in a toppy headspace. And I am primarily more toppy, generally speaking. And it does put me in a headspace of um, not provider. I don't identify as a provider. I think that's very different. See, I think I deviate from this bubble because I love my work, but I don't consider myself a provider, even though I'm technically providing. It just feels stupid because we're both providers. We're just providing different things. So I don't associate the word provider with top. Do you get what I'm saying? Like, I don't, re like, I, nobody's a daddy, but, you know, even if you're a mommy, like, you're still just a person. Who are you outside of being a daddy? Like, you can't just be a daddy. You're also a person. So it feels like she's maybe slightly playing into a fantasy she wants because this one guy like triggered something in her that was really sexy. Maybe she should keep it to a dungeon or like make it a scene. But to have it 24-7 I think is just, I don't know, it's a little silly. But you do you, I guess, you know. So I feel like sometimes there's like this confusion about what it means to be in love and have a partnership. And I feel like she's missing the forest for the trees a bit. But, you know, what do I know? My Jesus. You, know, you want a single, 
bitch. Jesus, Jesus could be high functioning, yes. smart. Yes. That nigga is Jesus not. He got. Be, he got Jesus bitches. Jesus could be crucified <laughs> and saved and resurrected. Yes. God, bring me Jesus. <laughs> there is no single man with no kids that is rich. Nick. That, I that date man them. does not know. I date them. They, they I are, date they them know all the time. Not, they ain't where they at. Baby, I date them. <laughs> They're they're dating. We're still dating. I don't have to rush into marriage because that are s- yes. single. Yes, fully single. Fully not single. Just you. Fully single. No kids. Fully single. No kids, baby. And they're younger though. They're 32, 33. Uh, they're they're younger. No. Yeah. Oh, that's young, young. They're ten years younger. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Hmm. She. Do you think she's joyful? She's definitely happy, but do you think she's joyful? Do you think she. Do you think she knows what her joy is? I think she's still. I think she's holding on to a dream that isn't. There's something here that doesn't make sense. Hmm. It's like she hasn't adapted. You know, 41 is fine. There's nothing wrong with being a 45-year-old mother. But also, why would you want to be? Like, I'll, I'll be real with you. Like, on purpose? Like, why are you trying to have a baby at 45? You know, like, what are you trying to have a 20-year-old at 64? You know what I'm saying? Like, why is that your life? You want to talk about a partner and thinking about the future? Why do you want to be 60 with a 20-year-old? Like, you can do it. My mom had her last baby at 40. But also, like, why? You know, why do you want to be 45 and have a baby? In this day and age, like, why? You know what I mean? But also, I don't know. There's something there. I don't know. Yes. Okay, that's, I'm not saying they're 40. They are younger. All right, all right. But even those dudes, come on now. No, uh, you know. You're telling uh, me those men that you're talking about don't got options? I'm sure they do, but why? I'm and, not concerned with options. And so, okay, yeah. so because as high valued as you are, and mm-hmm. I, as high functioning you are, they're probably those. They that's why they got Look, those. I want to say too. that this is the thing about being high functioning and calibrating someone who's high functioning. It's it's very good, but you got to be ready for that because they also come on their square as well, saying, "I'm high functioning," and so. I may not tolerate you when you decide if your old habits come in to run this muck. Yeah. So what I've learned. Oh, old habits die hard, but old habits can't be an old self. Old habits die hard, but there's got to be a point where you change fundamentally as a person and the habits you're dealing with are small things like slamming the cupboards too hard because you think you live alone. Old habits can't be walking out on your wife or hitting somebody or cheating or gambling or losing all your money. Like, you can't, this old self she keeps referencing, like if you're going to be your old self, you better be, your old self better be dead and buried. Discord says, I think uh, as a successful, educated black woman, she may want to feel sexy and submissive. So maybe she just wanted to experience the fantasy 24 seven, thinking that it would fulfill her. But based on her past relationships, I don't think it would fulfill her long term. I know black women often feel masculine against their will and may struggle with their femininity. So maybe that, so maybe she correlates her femininity with her submission. That's my theory too. What if this guy she was with before triggered that thing in her that she actually should keep to fantasy land instead of bringing it into a 24 hour thing? Because see, doing it 24 seven is different. It's like those women that are like, I want to take off my man's boots every time he comes home. Nobody got time for that girl when they're spit up on your bed because the baby just puked everywhere. And then the cat got its, you know, foot stuck in the door and there's food burning on the stove. Nobody got time to slowly take off your man's boots and lick his toes after work, ma'am. We have shit to do. Even in, even in BDSM, this whole like 24 seven submissive thing is not real. People have lives. We have jobs. We're taking care of our elderly parents who live in our basement apartment next to us. Like, please grow the fuck up. So I feel like sometimes this thing gets triggered inside of us, this fantasy land. Keep it to the bedroom, okay? No one's judging you for your bedroom shit. No one's judging you for an afternoon. But please be serious, okay? It's so funny. Like, we think about our future. We think about doing life with somebody. Think about your kids. Think about what your kids are growing up with. Think about who their parents will be. And through this is 
if my old habits is something that's going to be mm, more overtaken in the relationship, then I got to be what I got to accept a low functioning man, just like you with the low functioning woman you deal with, because he has to be able to tolerate my stuff. Yeah. But if I do get with a high functioning man equally yoked to me, then there is going to be a lot of awareness I have to have because he's also like me not going to tolerate low functioning behavior that is abusive and that's or you, disrespectful. You, that's you, you see what are I mean? At your perfection, at high your functioning, best. But, at your, but that shit ain't always going to happen. Now, but you, it shouldn't you know happen. Not. No, it shouldn't happen. It should be we're both high functioning enough to stick through this stuff. Yeah. Not to have, not to not have toxicity. Remember I just said. Because an alpha male who has everything that you desire and he's young, he going <laughs> he going to act out of ego. No, 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 no. That's fucked up. That's fucked up. Just, this is, okay. You know, I really hated growing up and having my dad say to me, Batsy, you play with fire, you're going to get burned. I was like, please do not say this because sometimes you say it and it pisses me off. But I'm going to be real with you. You play with fire, you're going to get burned, girl. And if you keep playing with these men that think being, quote, alpha means something, like they have a right to go out on you, they have a right to do stuff to you or do things in this marriage, have fun with your fire and your burns, girl, because no one have time to go to the emergency this often, okay? Some of us are busy healing. And I think sometimes this idea of he's got to make more, he's got to make money, he's got to do this. Girl, are you here for love or are you here for convenience? Because what Nick Cannon is offering is not love. What Andrew Tate is offering is not love. What Myron Gaines is offering is not love. What Trump is offering is not love. These men with all this money and all of this is not love. Okay? I'm not saying you have to marry the janitor. But I'm saying if he's the right person, why the fuck not? I'm not saying you have to date the guy with no job, but I'm saying if he's the right person, why not? I'm not saying you have to, I'm saying she just said earlier, be open to the guy not looking like you expected. Well, be open to the guy not making a billion dollars. You know, it's like you can do whatever you want, but the point is to make the team win. But I don't think she's an equal team player in that sense. But also, I don't know what's missing. You can't always guarantee you'll run into this person, but there is this person on the planet. There is a guy who made some form of money, who has some job, who's probably like a nerdy tech bro, who like never, you know, he probably has autism and he's never really left his bedroom, but he cleans up good. Maybe, you know, autists, but he cleans up good. He's got good money. He never had time to have kids and he can run into her. but maybe not. It's like, I'm not opposed to this guy she described existing, but I wonder if it really will make her happy or joyful. I don't know. Yeah, I'm just not convinced. Taylor, great reminder, says the concept of alpha was actually created by male scientists who wrongly thought of deer hierarchy. I think it was wolf hierarchies, right? And a case study of alpha versus followers. I thought it was a wolf study, but either way, it was a false study done and, and humans ran with it because they're fucking stupid. There's no such thing as alpha and betas. There's only personality types of dominant and bottom. So like, let's be real. Like ultimately with our personality types, I'm a more dominant personality type has little to do with my top or bottomness. You can have a dominant personality type and be a bottom, right? So when we're having these conversations, I think there's something in the way she's communicating it that tells me like something's off. I just, you know, I wonder what it is. Yeah, something feels off, but I don't, I, yeah. Oh, he's going to act out a certain, in, in his 100%. His emotional intelligence isn't all, isn't all the way there yet. You're yeah, right. Yeah, so. You're and, right. And in that, you're going to have right. to put up with some shit. You're right. And therefore. Absolutely. I'm Thank you, Mantis. I mean, but I wish you the best. But that's where <laughs> the maturity of we're going to go through some dysfunction and it's not about the dysfunction. It's about us sticking through it to get to the promised land. The promised mm -hmm. land comes over and over. I think this is her trauma still talking. I think this might be her bubble, but I think that for me, this is too... Damn, She 99% of the shit she said today was fire. 99% of the shit she, she said today was so good. But this part feels unhealed to me and it feels like a red flag in my bubble. My level of healthiness is like, no, but also this is, um, everyone's got a journey. Everyone's got a journey.
over and over again. It's not one landing. That is, I, I'm not right. I'm not disagreeing. When you flee and come back and you guys get to a resolve, that's the promised land. And then when it happens again, you're out the promised land. And then you're working to get back. And so that's called all, a relationship. It, all a relationship <laughs> is, is how do we get back yeah. to our square together and get us off of our own squares? How do we get back to this one square? That's it. Well, ladies, mm. you heard it. <laughs> From another high functioning woman to all the high functioning women out there. All of the functioning all in the people. Good fight. All of the functioning people. Keep up the people. good fight of faith. Damn. Because that make believe nigga is out there. <laughs> okay, we gotta go to the comments. I love comments. Okay, ready? I truly admire her for her professionalism and grace to, uh, because sometimes talking to a traumatized man like this is talking to a wall. Okay, I can see that. I can see that perspective. Hold on. Let me move me here. Thank you. Um, came here after the Newton interview. <laughs> Same girl. One thing both interviews proved was that most people are not self-aware and are in denial of their own BS. And most people tell on themselves, um, tell themselves comforting lies. Okay. He was thinking the whole time I married Mariah Carey. She ain't low functioning, but he just described how he got here, pretended to be someone he's not, then got all toxic on her. Um, let me see. Okay, we're all here after Cam Newton. Tell me about yourself. Proceeds to talk about himself as soon as he gets the chance. I like that she said, I like, she said, I think this is a huge problem with our society today is that men and women prefer commitment of being a parent over the commitment of being a partner. Nick doesn't want to listen and always says, I think when she drops gems. Hmm. She isn't saying forget your kids. She's saying you put each other first to build a foundation in a two parent household so it's healthy and functioning so you can feed into the child. Feed it into the child. Okay. Anybody commenting on her relationship? Anyone talking about her relationship? I need some hot stuff, baby, to see me. I need some hot stuff. I see the healed version of myself and her. She's truly giving me therapy. Baby tonight. She was clearly communicating at a level he could never understand and process because she's so high functioning and vibrational. His life is proof of it and he can make it seem as though he's content with it. But my question is, would you want your daughter to be with men like you? Yeah. Hmm. I loved her until the end. It felt a little unhealed to me. But I mean, we've all got it. Uh, interesting. Yeah, I, okay, I like her. I think what she said was good. I think it was a good interview. I think she said a lot of really important things. I think I would want to ask her, but why do you need this particular relationship? What are you fulfilling? What happened in that last relationship that triggered that thing in your brain that makes you think you now need it in a relationship all the time versus some of the time, right? I think that that's probably what I would wonder from her because she seems so put together. But that last part seemed like, ooh, that's where it is. That's your soft spot. I feel like that's the weak spot. You know, um, I always get, I got this asked this question from a YouTuber. I, I've brought it up before, but if you're new to my audience, somebody asked me, since you put it all out there on the internet, the thing you want from a partner, do you think somebody could use it to manipulate you into a relationship? And I said, no, because no matter how much I show to people, I can always tell when they don't see me. The difference is when I showed myself to my partner, not knowing he would eventually be my partner, I didn't have to work for him to see me. He just did. And that's what I had been looking for. I don't want to have to fight for a relationship when my life is so good. I want somebody who's the cherry on top. So I'm already complete as a person, which I think she mentioned, but he's like the cherry on top. His life was already solid. I was the cherry on top. We're looking at each other like, oh, damn. A great meal and dessert. We're like the cherry on top of our lives that were already established. He had his life, his life, you know, his job, his apartment, his friends, his thing. I had mine. And we were just kind of like doing this very single life and exploring. And then we started talking and boom. So the idea of like, oh, if I show myself to somebody, I have to keep a wall up. The right man will pull me by the hair, bend me over and fuck me like I've never been fucked. And that's how I'll know he's my person. I don't really know if you need to call your person daddy. It's not bad to call your person daddy. But is it necessary for true love? I highly fucking doubt it. Even the BDSM couples that I've known, and she's not BDSM, she's vanilla. But even the BDSM couples I know that start off with like that daddy thing. After 40 years of marriage, y'all, 
It's not about the BDSM and the whips and the chains. It's about the mutual respect and the love that you have in that relationship. And maybe daddy gets used less or maybe it's used just as much. And maybe the whips get used less and maybe they're used just as much. It's about the mutual love. It's about the compatibility. It's about companionship. It's about dying together. I just feel like this emphasis sounds like she's going back to the thing she warned us about for the two hours we were watching that, whatever it was, one hour we were watching that, which is, uh, what did she say? She said, it's so good. Wait, it just left my brain. Oh, for the moment. I don't know if she needs daddy for this moment because it sounds good or if she really thinks she's going to get daddy for the rest of her life. Because how daddy are you going to be when she's wiping your ass because you have Alzheimer's? Just seems kind of silly. But we are silly people. So it is what it is. Human's going to human. As the merch says, grab your merch links down below, guys. It does help support the content. Thank you so much. And thank you to those who have bought stuff. I get a little notification and I get a little happy every time I see it because I'm like, oh. So why's my life a mess? Please tell me cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool